If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So the first time we met Luke uh, was just you and I, Adam. We, yes. We did an LA podcast extravaganza. We were all over the place and we go into Luke's, house. first of all, cool guy. Yeah. Very cool guy. Super cool guy. Doesn't look anywhere near his age. Sorry, Luke. Uh, I'm not, I don't <laughs> actually know. I won't give away your age. Oh, he is very youthful. He's a very handsome, younger looking dude. Well, but we gave away his, his, his age on the show. He's well, 47. Well, yeah. I said it. Yeah. He looks, he looks a good yeah. 10 years younger than he his age. He looks like 20 something. But anyway, we show up at his house. He's got a cool house, man. You can tell this dude's like fashion, right? Like the house is cool. He's got like pictures and paintings of uh, like there's some naked women over here, but it's really artistic and great furniture and just great vibe. We go in there. He offers us some Four Sigmatic mushroom drink and, you know, gives us some like some great water. I don't remember what was in the water, but it was really nice. And we're sitting there and just had a great time. Po- that was the time you you choked. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, that was my, my first. <laughs> you know thing. what happened? I uh, tell me again because so, I vaguely remember. So this is this is, and you know what, dude? I got to give credit to Adam. Just fooled me. <laughs> totally fooled me. Oh, this was <laughs> this is a tactic. Yeah. This is actually like a tactic. Brilliant tactic. Out of it, right? Yeah. So we're podcasting, and it's it was been it's been a long day. Luke was the last podcast of the day. And we were just going, having a great time, and the conversation was getting kind of deep. And then Adam, I guess, so this is what it looked like to me. He's telling a story, and then he starts coughing, like, <clears throat> like starts choking, and he's and he's like, and he's like, give me some water. So I hand him the water, and I just take over. And I'm like, well, you know, crisis averted. He was coughing a little bit, gave him some water. I took over, no big deal. Afterwards, he's like, dude, he goes, I lost my train of thought, didn't know what I was going to say. And so that's why I started coughing. So the cough was not real. <laughs> <laughs> but I swear, dude, it was the most real. I was so full. I, I gave. Remember, I gave you my water. I'm like, here, bro, wow. drink my water. <laughs> That's some ninja stuff. I'm gonna right use, there. One of my next interviews, I'm going to use that as like an answer to a question because it's one of those behind the scenes things that if you only if you've been a mind pump listener for a long time, may have heard you tell that story before or that happened. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't know if you're just listening, right? If you're just listening to it, it does sound like that. No. Yeah. But it was the realest. <laughs> it was a realist situation. Yeah, this was- happens to me. This happens to me on a semi-regular basis, where my mouth just does not keep up with my brain. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like my brain is. I'm telling a story, and I'm like really into it. It's like, it's like going right. You're like mouth fatigue. And no, it's just yeah. The brain, and then the mouth is just like, oh shit! Like the oops, the brain got too far ahead. You know what I'm saying? The brain went like way down there, and like, no, you're not there yet. So that that happens to me too sometimes. And what I do is I just go where I was going. You know what I mean? So, like, if I, let's say I was going to make a point about <laughs> yeah, they don't, like so there's just like pieces that are just missing. Well, it's just, you just move forward. People are just like, God, you go all over the place with your stories, but they're really good. And it's like, well, I'm just going where like I forgot what I was going to say initially. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm going over here. Left. I'm turning right. Yeah, I do that. Uh, I do that to Katrina all the time, and she always looks back at me. She's like, Wait a second. What does that have to do with what we were first starting to talk about? I was like, like nothing. I don't remember. I just kept uh, going. What were you even <laughs> so, initially talking about? Which, which is ironic that we're sharing this right now. And the the na- Luke is Luke story, and it's kind of unique how he's done this whole thing. And his uh, as far as his podcast and he's his got message, a great podcast. He's got a great story. Yeah, you know. So Luke's got a great story, and um, he's very very open and honest. Crazy Man. story. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't even want to share some of it because I want people to listen to it because like it's, it's like it's unbelievable. Some of the stuff I that I can't he's believe gone he made it out. You know, like and he became who he is today. It's just like fascinating. Well, I couldn't help but look at you guys when he was sharing uh, childhood stories of him being eight or nine or eight and nine years old because I'm looking at you guys knowing that you guys have kids that age and thinking like. Listen to what this guy was doing at that. Uh, I can't even fathom. Right, like, it was just like I can't even comprehend this. Yeah, no, I, I, it, it's a great, but you know, because it ended up okay, I can listen to it. You know what I mean? I yeah. can hear it because I'm looking at the guy as he's telling it, and he's a he's a great guy. He looks healthy. He's got a successful podcast. He's had successful business. So, right, I can. But man, crazy shit this guy's been through. Anyway, Luke's story has a podcast. It's a great podcast called the Life Stylist Podcast. It's about optimizing your life, uh, both. 
mentally, spiritually, physically. So he has lots of like like health hackers and stuff like biohackers. And he on doesn't there and he doesn't come from like trying to be a guru about it. He introduces to you to a lot of gurus, and he's a very normal guy and admits that and doesn't try and sound like he's an expert. Yeah. And he just sh- he shares his story, and That's he's right. a, like a cool guy. Right. You know what I mean? Like you don't get a lot of people in this space that are like actually cool people that you would hang out with. So yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh wow, this is a nice change of I'd, pace. Bro. I'd be seen in public with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, his podcast, like I said, the Lifestylist podcast. You can find him online, Luke Story. That's S T O R E Y dot com, and then Instagram at Luke Story. Um, and oh, and also, this is I think this is going to air on the first of April, which gives you like it's crunch time. Summertime's around the corner. Time to look awesome. This is when you take your shirt off and you show off your body. Oh yeah, and your midsection. So check this out. A lot of people don't know this, but we all we have a program that is designed specifically to train your core, your midsections. It is now I designed this program a long time ago and it was to build visible abs, to give you the bricks, to give you the six pack that shows even at higher body fat percentages. Um, so it's a well programmed ab and core training program. It's called the No BS Six Pack Formula. We're gonna give that to you for free this month if you enroll in any bundle, any maps bundle. Now maps bundles takes several MAPS programs, combines them together, and discounts them about 30% off or so. So if you get any bundle, we'll throw in the No BS six-pack formula absolutely for free. And yes, you can combine all of them. And that's this month only. For more information on that and any other program, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to Luke Story of the Lifestylist Podcast. Dude, I'm inspired by your studio, though. This is awesome. Thanks, man. This is like my... Uh, yeah, I, yeah, by noon, though, because then the real people... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the band gets here. My then par- then my out. parents come home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. It took us a hot minute, though, to get here. We did. It, you know what? I was actually meaning to throw up... Remind me after this podcast. Remind me to throw up a picture or have... Taylor put a picture up on the uh, Mind Pump page of the uh, picture. I have quite a few pictures of the three of us and Doug's living room. In a, on a little on a, uh, on, a, on a little table, you know, when we all first when we first started doing this, that's you know? dope. Right, that's right. dope. Yeah, I have um, some 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 of my YouTube videos when I didn't discover that you could use those mics, and I cram like I think it was like who did I have in there? It was Rich Roll, and. Uh, he came over and we're sitting like <laughs> it's like we're about to kiss in the fucking video. We're super super Damn. close, and then I realized like oh I could just get different mics and move in the living room and make a little. Set. How did you? That's that's one of the people I saw. I like it, I was talking off air with you about yeah. you know I've, you've had quite the lineup lately. And how was Rich Roll? What was that like? Oh, uh, Rich is awesome, man. You know it's funny we, we he's ha- very even kill, right? Yeah, yeah. especially I don't know how I say this. Fuck it, I'll just say it. Especially for someone who's on- You're a mind pump. I'll fucking say whatever you want to say, dude. Especially for someone who's on a, a plant-based diet. And and no offense, but a lot like over... I mean, I've been in the health scene for 21 years. And over the years, I've been around a lot of people that follow a different regimen. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes people that are on like the raw food thing are sort of on a different wavelength and be super hyper and kind of blood sugar crazy and not right. that mm-hmm. grounded. But he's got his practice. So, you know, he is a spiritually oriented person. So he was super chill. Yeah, he was great. And what's what's awesome about Rich too is that he's an advocate for his way of eating and living, but he doesn't shame other people. He's not dogmatic yeah. about it. Yeah. That's what I really liked about him. He, yeah. Because you can get, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you've been in fitness as long as we have. Uh, you know, nutrition is right that's up religion. there with politics and religion. Yep. I mean, I, I would venture to say that's the, the third worst thing to talk about, like at the family dinner table. Yep. Bit, because yep. people... People get very, and now more than ever, being someone who's been doing this for a very long time, you know, it's it was kind of like that before, but we've we've created so many of these fucking diets now. Now it's gotten crazy. It's like religions. It's a, it is a weird thing when you kind of identify who you are as a person based on the kind of fuel you put in your body. Right. It's sort of like, you know, you think you're a car, so you're like, I'm an unleaded. I'm a leaded. <laughs> you know, it's like... I don't even. I'm high octane. I do, yeah, I just yeah. think about food as like what works for your body best. Because I was a vegetarian for ten years, so I've, I've been down that road, and that shit almost killed me, you know. But I don't. I don't walk around going, "I'm a meter." Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm a high fatter. You yeah. know, it's just like what. That's just like. Well, I think uh, not even relevant. I think especially when you talk about veganism, um, a, a large percentage of vegans are motivated to eat that way, not because they're seeking better health, 
but more so because they find it immoral or wrong to you know eat an animal. So for them, it really is a a belief system, right? You know what I mean, so right. it is guess, a, it is kind of like a religion for them, right? That's true. That's true. I guess why that I guess that's why that's more prevalent when you have when some people have that approach to be so dogmatic and also so in some cases aggressively judgmental toward other people well, yeah, to learn you, on that. Exactly. If you thought you were like, every time you ate, you know, so your friend ate something, you thought they were killing something that you believed to be, you know, right. on the same you know, plane as right. humans or whatever, you would be dogmatic about it. And they're putting it. barbecue right. sauce on it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. right, right. It's kind of fucked yeah. up. Yeah. I, I did an interview with, uh, Diana, yeah, with uh, Diana Rogers, who has got a podcast called Sustainable Dish. And she, she's really cool because she's a dietitian and a farmer. She's like, got a farm in Massachusetts and, uh, we were we had a great talk about all of this stuff and you know the the morality of eating meat or not eating meat because I, I was a vegetarian because a this is back in like the late nineties I think that I went into that and I didn't know there was an alternative to factory farm meat but I knew that that was bad as I started to go down the rabbit hole and then there was also the moral things like dude I don't want to kill an animal um, but we were talking about it and it's like <laughs> if you even if you just if you grew an acre of kale. In order to do that, you got to kill thousands of animals mm -hmm. and creatures of all kind, lizards, birds, rodents, snakes, you know, like, so it's like, there's kind of no way to eat any sort of diet without killing. No, things. I think, I think, um, it's interesting just to look at it from that perspective. You got to realize yeah. like, you know, that's just how it works. Food comes from something that's alive. Even plants, plants are alive too. So right. if you go down that ra rabbit hole, like, what are you going to, you know, we're going to eat, yeah. you know, what are we going to eat? Soylent? And if, yeah. you've, and if you've ever tried to grow food, have you guys ever had like an urban garden or tried to grow food? I've attempted. It's not Dude, easy. Dude, you know why it's hard? Because you're at war with all the other animals and creatures that want to eat your shit. Right. We're not the only ones that like fucking spinach. Yeah. Right. You know, so <laughs> even if like, I'm like, fuck this, I'm going plant-based and I'm going to grow my own food. I'm going to have to kill a bunch of creatures just to grow my food because they're going to come take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I try. I had an urban garden in Hollywood and these fucking raccoons man <laughs> <laughs> come every night i'd come and all my shit would be gone and then finally i set up oh my god it's funny i set up like a laptop in the window to, to and then put the camera on that i could that was like my you know my like what do you call it like security camera because i couldn't figure out what it was and then it caught i was like oh it's a raccoon so i set up this little trap where there was a trip wire if they got into my little veggie you know um planter that it would have this trip wire, and then I put all this powdered cayenne pepper on a little board that would flip it and flip in his face. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, I'm totally nuts. <laughs> Did it work? Pepper yeah, spray. it worked, dude. Oh, yeah, shit. it was. Uh. Like, and I was like, because I don't want to poison him. I'm not going to go out there with my 22 and shoot. Yeah. I mean, you know, instead you you, you, you some guillotine. Yeah, 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 you made yeah. him spicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. For, <laughs> for later on, funny shit. But that's when I realized I was like, oh man, you, if you try to grow anything, you're actually at war with the animal yeah. kingdom because right, right, right. they they're hungry too, just like you are. Yeah. Luke, you said you've been doing this for. 20 years? Is that what you said? In you know, I, I got into to health and, and fitness and meditation, spirituality, all that stuff really committed 21 years ago because I was an incorrigible drug addict living in Hollywood. And uh, that's when every, the world kind of came crashing down on me. And I was sort of forced at first to learn how to cleanse and, you know, just live a clean lifestyle in all ways and also to adopt different spiritual practices and yoga and all of that stuff. But even before that, it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day, even when I was like smoking crack all night and running around the streets of Hollywood, still every day I would go get like a big green juice and I was doing superfoods. I'd always had take huge pills, you know, like handfuls of vitamins and stuff like that. And my friends would always clown on me like, okay, dude. You're addicted, to heroin. You know, you're addicted to heroin. <laughs> you're addicted to heroin. You're a crackhead. You smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. But you're, you take your multivitamins. Yeah. Those vitamins, so. <laughs> you're a full on fucking yeah. alcoholic. You're drunk off your ass every damn night. And then why do you bother doing this stuff? But I, I knew it was like, well, I'm, I know I'm killing myself. I'm not that delusional. And so I thought, well, I'll just add all this stuff in. So for about the last five years before I really hit bottom and became fully committed to this, I was also sort of learning about health and stuff, weirdly enough. What was the what was the impetus? What was the final impetus? Because you said forced. They got forced into this. Like, no, what was fuck it that. that but go back even further. I want to know what led you to even get addicted to all those things. Like what? Well, you know, when I was, I th it's a pretty classic case. When I was a kid, I experienced a lot of trauma. I mean, parents were divorced when I was three. Um, was sexually abused by a babysitter when I was around five or six. Uh, right after that, I immediately started getting kicked out of school. I started lighting fires, 
reading, you know, porno magazines, hitting kids in the head with the fucking two by four. Like wow. I was just, I went nuts after a- a- angry kid. Yeah. After that, after I had that experience and I didn't tell anyone, you know, of course this is like 1975 or something. There wasn't therapy and shit like that. Now, if your kid starts acting out, you would, there'd be an indication that he had experienced some trauma or something. Mm. So I just held it in and just, you know, I had to find a way to medicate because I felt so much shame and guilt and just I didn't know how to like compute what had happened to me and that was like kind of when things got set off and then that same babysitter I don't know if I tried it was it was it a slow process or did you like start off with oh ever occasionally doing this because it was kind of no it was it was right away it was like that one babysitter I don't remember if I smoked it or not but the first time I saw weed I was like five or six and I remember what a bong looked like there was like bong hits happening I don't remember if I had any but I do remember having my first drink when I was about six. Damn. And also like attempting to have sex with little girls in the neighborhood. I, you know, I didn't know how to like follow through, mm-hmm. but we'd get naked and get in bed like grown ups. I mean, I was like, I had a really weird childhood. But as far as the drug thing, probably when I was maybe eight or nine, I grew up in Northern California in the 70s. And what happened in in the Bay Area. Oh, well, fuck, we're in the Bay Area. Right. I don't have to explain it to you guys. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're in San Jose. I totally forgot. We're in this dark room. Like, I don't know where we are. Um, you're, at the, the, you're in the cube. Yeah. And after the summer of love, you know, all the hippies from the hate kind of migrated up north into Sonoma and Mendocino. Mm-hmm. And they were all, you know, into drugs. And so the culture that I grew up in, in Sebastopol and Santa Rosa and up there, there's just everyone grew weed. I remember just rummaging through you know everyone's parents shit when they would leave the house you go under the mattress you go in the closets i mean we'd find huge bricks of hash we'd find like literally like a half pound of coke like fresh off the boat you know my mom's boyfriend was a drug dealer i mean just copious amounts of drugs were available and so you combine the availability and just the trauma and the dysfunction in my family and in my home. And I love my parents. We all has since been forgiven, but mm-hmm. you know, there were issues there and there's a lot of, there's dude. And my, like my mom's boyfriend was a dealer and he eventually went to prison. He got busted. Um, he dealt to the Hange, hell's angels. And that was like the scene. It was like bikers. And then in my little neighborhood, uh, was, um, bikers and what we used to call low riders. Now you call them cholos. They didn't used to have shaved heads. They had like long hair with a hairnet, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> And uh, riding lowriders, and you know that was the scene. So I would steal drugs from him, and then sell them to the gangs. And, and how um, old are you at this point in your life? Are you young? You by really that, young? well, I started smoking weed like on the reg and drinking and stuff, probably eight or nine. And then by holy the, shit, dude, by that the, is so young, dude. It's it is. It's weird because when I see a kid now, like homies of mine have kids that are that age, and I'm like, oh my god, yeah. imagine that kid like you know, s- snorting Coke. It's like, what? Even smoking weed or getting drunk is like weird. But by the time all the gnarly shit started happening, it was like 12 or 13. And that's when I was in the neighborhood with, you know, where there's a lot of gangs and just really nasty shit going on. And uh, yeah, I used to, it's funny others, not funny. It's funny now at the time, it'd be kind of tragic, but my mom's boyfriend, the dealer that eventually got busted, I mean, he used to go get the Coke in Bodega Bay, like off the boat from Columbia. Holy shit. Yeah, so it was good Coke, I got to say. <laughs> it was not... Like, it was, like all yeah, yeah, at least my first... Ex- I, and you know, it's funny because I did like really good like flaky... You turned you into a Coke snob. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, then when I moved to LA in, the, in 89, I was like, uh, whatever you guys, that's not Coke. You know, I was in the rock and roll scene. People were like, dude, you want some blow? I was like, what the fuck is this? No, this has been stepped on like 500 times. But, uh, you know, he used to uh, run guns, too. So, wow. Yeah, this is like, so I'm like 12 years old and and I'm not trying to glamorize this, you know, or be sensational. It's just, it's interesting now because Mm -hmm. my life is so different. And the arc of the story is phenomenal as what's happened to me and how uh, happy and successful I am in so many ways. But there was um, this closet in my mom's room and he used to store all the guns in there, you know? And when he would leave, I would like <laughs> raid the house and I'd go in there and he had Uzis and shit. And I'd go in there. Yeah. I'd go in there, And I even know how to use guns. You know, my dad was a gun guy, like Hunter and like legit gun guy, not a criminal gun guy, legal guns, you know? So I kind of got it. You pull the trigger, you check the thing, you know, but yeah, I'd go out in the backyard with the Uzi. That, 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 that. Oh my god! And it's like in suburbia. That's what's so weird. My mom still lives in that house, and I'm going, "How the fuck did the FBI not show up or (laughs) something?" You know, it's bizarre. And then I do other shit like 
this one kid, Jerry, that I hated. We had train tracks behind the house, and I don't know why I hated him. Jerry Ferry used to call him. And my mom grounded me because it was like homophobic to say that. But Jerry would walk behind the house. I hated that fucker. So I would, I would like point a gun over the fence and be like, yo, hey, motherfucker. And then I would like firecrackers like behind oh the fence my God, just dude. to see his ass like <laughs> run down the train tracks. And he'd think, I was like, that, 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 you know? Oh you my God. This is how I grew up. And then eventually, so anyway, to fast forward the story, because um, we'd go on all day with crazy shit like that. But um, eventually I got arrested for breaking and entering. I used to like rob houses. That's how I. How old were you when you got arrested? Uh, thirteen, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Fuck I used to just case. Son. I used to just case out the neighborhood for the druggies. If they had long hair and shit, I would break into their house and steal their dope. Basically, so how old's your son right now? He's twelve. Fuck, yeah, I can't even, no. my daughter's eight. Can when you say eight or nine? I, know, I can't even imagine. Eight, yeah, it's ever. crazy. Yeah. My, my, my my daughter doesn't even watch movies with the f word in them. You know? Oh wow! Yeah, it's crazy. Good for you, dude. Yeah, well, it's just insane. Yeah, yeah. You grew up really fast. Yeah, but the good news is, you know, so I get, I got arrested. I get sent away to this cult boarding school in Idaho, where I mean, this was, now this was this state like state mandated. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, because I got, I, I was shipped out to live with my dad in Aspen, <clears throat> Colorado, and because uh, I was too, my mom just couldn't handle me, and she had her own problems to deal with in that area as well. And so, uh, yeah, they shipped me out to live with dad. I immediately get busted breaking into a house. The people came home when I was inside the house. You know? Holy shit. I was doing a <laughs> fucking home invasion and the people came in. I was like, oh, hey, oh. how are you? You know, nice to meet you. And I've tried to run and they caught me. And then so I got sent away to this really bizarre school in northern Idaho where I was sequestered for two years. And that was great because that kind of put the brakes on my whole trajectory. So it was a good thing. It was. It was weird. And a lot of people, I think, were traumatized by the things that happened at that school quote unquote because there was really no school it was like therapy mm-hmm. uh, but I got out of there and at least what were what were what were some of the rumors about that school I don't know anything I mean room it was called Rocky Mountain Academy put it this way the alumni of Rocky Mountain Academy have Facebook groups that are like survivors of Rocky Mountain Academy oh, not wow. like oh. students so of or graduates is of, it you know? a lot like have you seen the movie sleepers no, I haven't. Oh shit! Uh, okay, yeah. you won't get the, you won't get the reference. Then. I got to see that. Well, now. Yeah, well, the it's about and I think it's based off a true story, and it's like a boys it's a boys' home, and all the all the guards and all the employees were totally molesting all the all the boys that were going to school there. Oh shit! Yeah. Thankfully, it wasn't like that. It was more like unqualified armchair therapists that were like ex hippies that were into personal development and stuff like that. So. What was controversial about it is some of their punishment methods would be like you'd have to go out and like work on the hill by yourself in the snow and build a trail for 10 hours and you're like 15 years old. And uh, they'd have group therapy sessions that were called raps where you would have to confess all of your, you know, shameful deeds and you being molested and all the weird shit you've done sexually and all that kind of stuff. And then you know, in front of a whole group of your peers and you'd be screamed at and yelled at and a lot of crying and just weird stuff. So it's hardcore. Yeah, like sleep deprivation. Uh, They had these things called profits that were these like between two and maybe four or five day intensives where they'd keep you up all night and make make you drink coffee and nudge you if you fall asleep and do all of this brainwashing type stuff. But Mm -hmm. the brainwashing was good. It was like to teach you how to love yourself and be a good person and stuff like that. You know, it wasn't like trying to get them brainwash you to believe in a leader or something. Is that what really kickstarted you in the back? Oh, wow. Yeah. So when I got out of there. Is that impactful for you? Yeah. When I got out of there, I, you know, I wasn't a little Hesher. You know, I was a total stoner, a little Hesher. I had long hair, wore Aussie shirt every day. When I got out of there, I wore like pink polo shirts and had my hair part on the side <laughs> oh, and shit. Wow. You know, I was like, I was reformed. Uh, and then I never, after how that. Long, how long was it? Two years. Oh, okay. That's yeah, a- 14 to 16. Oh, shit. So for two years, you're kind of going through all yeah, that. Yeah, dude. A Whoa. lot. A, That's intense. A lot of, you know, just constant therapy, like five day a week, massive therapy sessions. And it, it, it turned me around, but here's the problem. They didn't have, unfortunately, like addiction recovery integrated into that. Mm-hmm. It was just like, well, using's bad. You shouldn't do that because it creates all these problems. So when I got out, I was like, cool, I'm going to stay away from that shit, stay away from the bad kids when they threw me back in a public high school in this small ass town in uh, Basalt, Colorado, outside of Aspen. So I kind of knew that, but I didn't know that I had that gene, you know, that dope fiend gene. Mm -hmm. And so like, I remember my 17th birthday, my friend's like, dude, just take a hit, just take a hit. And they were all smoking weed. And I was like, I don't do that. And I was holding out on willpower. And dude, you said, did it happen all at once? This is when I really saw the power of whatever this thing is that I have is 
I took like a couple hits off a joint and got so fucking high because it had been two years since I got high. I was laying on the floor hallucinating, just fucking living the dream. And from that moment on, I immediately started doing acid in high school and um, snorting coke and just, you know, we'd go skiing in Aspen and take fucking acid and just like, just madness from day one. All in high school. Yeah. My first acid trip was, I came on in home ec and like, here's how you work a Tupperware set and it's all melting and shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Who oh, no. <laughs> um, so, so fast forward a couple years, I finally make it to Hollywood. That was the dream, man. I wanted to go like hang out with Guns N' Roses and like be in the, you know, the late eighties, like Hollywood rock scene. And play what was guitar. the goal when you went over there? Did you have a job in mind or are you just like, I'm going to Hollywood? I wanted to be around musicians and I wanted to be able to do drugs without my parents fucking my oh, high wow. up. Wow. And so I moved to Hollywood. Were you uh, super attached to music and then were you? Yeah. Yeah, music was my savior. I mean, that was like my the healthy outlet, you know, like the first time I heard Jimi Hendrix, dude, it was at my uncle's house on vinyl. And my mom used to clean his house in exchange for him babysitting me. And I'll never forget the first time I heard like Purple Haze on fucking vinyl and she would be vacuuming the house. So she, at the other end of the house, so she'd let me turn it up all the way. And it was just like, oh my God, that was my first spiritual experience really wow. in a healthy sense. So I knew that I wanted to be a rock star, but I didn't know how to play anything. So I moved to Hollywood. Within two weeks, I was doing heroin, maybe like six months. I'm smoking crack. Whoa. Yeah, but I was living the dream because I was hanging out with all these rock stars and kids, you know, like dudes that were on the posters in my you know, room when I was in high school. I mean, it's like I immediately just fell into like the coolest rock scene. I was hanging out with my heroes and then they taught me how to play bass and I started playing in bands and had a really great time just slain much ass and just living the dream. I had my fake ID. I was 19. <laughs> so I got into every club and everyone kind of took me under their wing because I was the new kid in town and I was a sweet kid and I had been reformed in, in that boarding school. So I didn't, you know, I didn't steal anymore. I didn't do like fucked up shit. I just wanted to get high in peace and like be left alone, you know, and just party. So that the school was effective anyway, but <clears throat> to the, to the point is it just, it's a long and probably interesting story, but there's so much positive stuff on the other side of that. Uh, when I was 26, the pivotal moment was, Sal, is that I just got to this point where the self-hatred and the shame and the self-loathing got to be so extreme that there was no amount of drugs that could kill it anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I would be to the point of almost an overdose <laughs> But I couldn't get that euphoric relief or even that numbness that I was always looking for. So you, so you literally lost the 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 good part of the drug. At yeah, least. yeah. Because all you know, I don't think I'm not like a sober person who thinks drugs are bad. Like you guys are like, oh, we smoke weed. I'm like, fucking great. I wish I could smoke weed. I would if I could. Right. Just now, you have I, a really cool I, attitude for someone who's been through everything that you've been through with it. Well, dude, I mean, it's live and let live, you know, I, and I'm being totally honest. If I could smoke weed here and there and not end up a heroin addict again, I would. Weed's great. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's not the poison, it's the dose. That's the thing. I mean, this morning I took like one tenth of a gram of psilocybin. Mm. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to get high. I'm 21 years sober, dude. I know when I'm crossing a fucking line and when I'm not. So I'm not, uh, definitely not a dogmatic or judgmental sober. Pr- I mean, how could I judge someone who's like <laughs> using drugs, dude? That was like the first half of my life. That that's was- that's a lot of self-awareness though. When did that really start to happen for you? Because that was one of the things when Sal and I came down, one of the things I really, really liked about you was you're one of the most authentic people that I've had the opportunity to meet. And we've met a lot of people, man. And you could just sense that when you meet somebody who's just, you've obviously been extremely vulnerable and put yourself out there. Where did that come from? Where did you start to be, become so introspective when did you start well because my you know and i'm not being dramatic but my my life was on the line in a very real sense when i was 26 that's when this i kind of had this spiritual awakening which <laughs> is like everything i say i'm like and that's another story and that's another story but there are so many sort of through lines but i think in order for any any human being to overcome adversity you really put in a position where you have to face the truth about yourself and that's, you know, literally the first step in getting over any addiction is admitting to yourself that you have a problem. And so that was that first moment of self-honesty and self-awareness was like, I can't beat this thing. Cause I tried, it's like, I tried to moderate like, Oh, I'll just stay off the hard stuff. You know, if I could Mm -hmm. just smoke weed, I'll be cool. I tried that for years. And then if I would smoke weed, it's like, well, I got one beer, I have one beer and then I have 
20 beers. And then I'm like, this is boring. Let's snort some Coke. Mm. Cool. Someone's got a line. I do a couple lines. I'm like, this is boring. Let's smoke some Coke. Uh. Smoke some Coke. I'm like, well, I'm fucking, my heart's beating out of my chest. We better get some heroin. And then that goes that cycle, you know? So the first self-awareness is like, wow, I'm like seriously an addict and there's no moderating, there's no controlling. And then that kind of um, was the first requirement was then to start looking deeper. Well, why do I do drugs? Like, why do I need to be high all the time? Right. Why can't I sit in a room with guys like you and just hang out? Why Why do I have to be fucked up to go to the grocery store? You know what I mean? It's like I literally was so uncomfortable and had so much self-hatred and self-loathing and just I felt so awkward in my skin <coughs> that I had to start looking deeper. Well, what is that? Oh, it's the trauma when I was a kid. It's It's the way that my mind works, that I'm perpetually in fight or flight. I'm always in fear. I have so much anger and hostility and rage buried inside. So I had to start to really look inwardly through meditation and different spiritual practices and just addiction recovery in general in order at first just to survive. And then I started to realize like, wow, I actually don't need any of those crutches anymore. Over the years, I started to really use that. So I, I appreciate the highest compliment I think anyone could give someone is like, they're real. <coughs> You don't have to like me, but I would, <laughs> I'd rather be respected than liked. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, and if right. someone's real, you might go, guy's a douche. I don't believe with any, anything he said. You know, I, I don't believe in anything that he believes in. He's on a different path, whatever. But like, hey, he's real at least. Right, right. You know, and yeah. that's, that's what I appreciate in people too is that realness. Did you, Did you have a, a, a book or a mentor or something at that, that time, that pivotal time in your life? Was there something that, that you were consuming that made you like really absorb all that and kind of change your ways? Well, the very first part of that, and it's, you know, it's delicate <laughs> because of the na the nature of um, the principle of anonymity. But I just, I'll just say that I got really involved in addiction recovery. You know, I went to a treatment center and when you go to a treatment center, they send you out of there and they're like, if you want to keep this 28 days that you have, you need to go to meetings and like do the whole recovery thing. And so I proceeded to do that. So my gateway into you know, the life that I'm living now has been learning spiritual principles, dude. One of them being self-honesty and self-awareness. That's a spiritual truth. It's a universal truth. And so I started uh, surrounding myself with other sober people and, and building and becoming part of a community that supported my spiritual growth. Because soon after I got sober, I realized like, oh shit, unfortunately, the drugs weren't what the problem was. I'm the problem. Right. Wherever I go, there I am. Because right. I have a mind that constantly tortures me. I mean, the dude, back in the day, the idea of being present, like being able to have a conversation with you, look you in the eye and stay here without my mind kidnapping me and taking me into some future Armageddon or some past pain or trauma or something is like totally impossible. What do you think mm. about today? Like kids today with technology and things like that, and that that ability to be able to do that. Do you, I think it's harder today than it even was back when we were young. Sure, uh, and I have a, a a rough upbringing too, and so I can totally connect to a lot of your story. But what do you think about the kids today with this? All these things that we're constantly attached to with these fake dopamine rushes that we're getting all the time. What do you think? How how challenging it is for them to become completely present? Man, I you know it's one of the things. I don't have kids. I'm 47 and. Uh, I was always pretty afraid of having kids, I think, just because I was so self-centered, to be honest. You know, just like, I don't want to have my schedule interrupted. I'm very spontaneous. I just kind of live on the fly. So I don't have kids myself, but um, I think, you know, I would probably like to at some point if, you know, the circumstances kind of dictated that and everything f fell into place naturally. Uh, and I think about that like, dude... Just coming up in the 70s and 80s was challenging with all of the negative influence. But just the fact that, you know, like your 10 year old boy can like open up his iPhone and watch like freaking gangbangs in two seconds. You know, it's like, oh my God. dude, yeah. shit. If I would have been turned loose with an iPhone when I was a kid, who knows if I ever would have pulled my head out of that thing, you know? So it's, it is challenging. I think as a parent, man, you've, and I'm no expert on the subject, but wow, you got to really instill in that kid that love and that connection that right. human connection and i think also god how important it would be to to 
build some sort of sense of, of community around that kid. Cause I think a lot of the, the neurosis we have as a society, whether it manifests in addictions or just general craziness is really a lack of human connection. Right. No, I, you know what I'm saying? We've evolved to hang in tribes of 40, 50 people for our entire life, yeah. right. get hugs all day long, get human touch, look in people's eyes that, that human connection I feel is really, is really what we've lost. And so, man, it, it's a challenging thing as a parent. you got to really foster that. And I think that'd be easier to do in a smaller town, quite frankly. I mean, I think if I had kids, I probably wouldn't live in the middle of Hollywood like I do. Right. At least get on the outskirts, like have a little more of a tight-knit community that's not so overwhelming. But yeah, the screen time is difficult for me. I'm like, oh my God. You oh, get- I, that's how I feel. I feel the same yeah. way. I can't imagine what it's like for a young teenage boy or girl. Like, it's got to be crazy. Yeah. Well, how hard was the transition into you starting to date sober? Like, so if you did this rock star, <laughs> this rock star lifestyle, banging all these girls and, yeah. and doing all this coke and living with all these rock stars, then all of a sudden I'm sober. You got to probably learn, learn yourself. Dude, what was that like? That is so awesome, bro. No one has ever asked me that question. Yeah. And you know what? I'll be honest. It was terrifying, dude. I remember the first girl that I attempted to have sex with when I was sober. Cause I hadn't, I hadn't, I had actually never had sex sober. The first time I did it, you know where the first, you know where the place was when I lost my virginity for the first time? Hmm. San Jose, California, oh. <laughs> right here, woo, boom, woo, full, full circle. circle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's and you know, and it's funny. And I won't. I, I, I used to name her name, and then I'm like, whoa, she's still around. I actually looked her up on Facebook, and I was like, hey, what's up? And she, I, she lives somewhere around here. Um, still, <laughs> and I was like, sorry, I ghosted. Kind of a pattern. Um. So what but, was yeah what? so so the first time I tried to have sex it was like dude it was like that thing in high school is it gonna work is it gonna happen am I gonna do my thing too fast you know? oh you started having those oh thoughts my god again. yeah because and you're I, how old at that point dude twenty six years old right yeah mm-hmm. I mean it was it was terrifying because I started boning when I was sixteen in eighty six <laughs> so I had ten years of solid Which just by using boning I you love could, it. we could have figured that <laughs> out yeah, yeah it's a great term I yeah. had ten years of solid bone time <laughs> and it. It was, but I was all anesthetized. You know what I mean? Like I was either, I was, I was definitely always on weed at least, even if it was like in the, in the, you know, like a wake up bone, I would always, first thing I did right when I wake up is like bong hits, like just immediately before I even take a piss. So I probably have never even had sex, you know, at that point sober at all, really. Maybe I woke up one day and hadn't taken a bong hit and, you know, slipped it Mm in. So it was terrifying, dude. And You know, that's one of the things I realized. It was, again, it's like, oh, wow, the drugs and alcohol is not my problem. The problem is I feel like shit about myself. I'm like, I have no self-worth. I mean, my self-worth was like, a friend of mine used to say, lower than whale shit. (laughs) You know, that's as low as you can go. You know, That's a new one for me. And I was just, I would do what it was is I just, I was so (laughs) caught up in my head. I had no connection to my body, no connection to my heart. I hadn't started doing yoga yet and getting embodied and like understanding how to harness that energy and control that energy. So how many dates and relationships did you fuck up on along the way here? Oh my God, dude. I mean, I think I'm still fucking them up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, it's funny right now, as we sit and record this, I'm, I've, taking a break from sex and dating. I'm nine months celibate. <clears throat> and even like yesterday, I was in Whole Foods and I saw this smoking girl in line and I was like, oh, now is when I go up and talk to that girl and like say what's up. And I was like, oh yeah, no, I'm not doing that right now. I'm taking a decided break just to really regroup. Um, but, you know, my early relationships were were very, very flawed, dude, because I didn't, no one modeled for me how to do that. Right. My parents hated each other, you know, and there were, there was, all I ever heard from my mom is like, men are bad. And all I ever heard from my dad is like, women are trying to take your money, you know? So it's like, I had no semblance of a healthy family life uh, to model. So my early relationships were, you know, very, um, Oh, they just, you know, it would always, you'd get past the honeymoon phase after, you know, three months, six months, nine months, and then poof, they would kind of disintegrate. But I also wasn't that interested in having a relationship. I just wanted to have fun. And once I learned how to get out of my head and I started actually building some self-esteem and learning how to be more authentic and real and communicate with women um, and date and things like that, and just, I, I got out of that fear state Then I started to have fun. There was like this sort of late rebirthing in my 30s where I went out and just smashed and had a great time. It was very real. And I think 
a lot of the time had a lot of integrity about what I was doing. Like, cool, go on a date. Hey, listen, I'm not the guy that's going to settle down. I'm the guy you have fun with. Are you down? They're cool. They're down. And that's kind of the way I lived. But what I'm learning now is really what was going on my whole life is I was really terrified of intimacy. I was terrified of being abandoned again. You know, my parents sent me away when I was 14, dude. I never knew that was abandonment. That shit hurt. I mean, I can feel it in my heart now just remembering them dropping me off at that school and being like, peace, you don't have parents anymore. You know, right. even my mom shipping me away at 13. She's like, bye, I can't handle you. And she gave me up. And isn't that crazy how something like that, how it just cements a pathway in your brain? Oh, dude. And it's forever that it's, it's there. Yeah. And so now, you know, in my adult relationships in my 40s, I mean, there's this certain point of intimacy that I get to. And I'm like, Ugh. My heart's becoming open and vulnerable and it's really scary. And that's why I'm taking a break now is to really examine where I am in my life. Now that I'm at a point where, wow, I really would like the the experience of, you know, the companionship. Pers- yeah, companionship and closeness <clears throat> and trust and loyalty and and a real thing. And I've had some of those. I mean, I've had a few great relationships in the past few years. You know, they ended for whatever reason, but most of them not tragically, just kind of like, ah, we're, this is not working anymore and we're, we're cool, you know? What do you learn from these, from these relationships? Uh, I think the most meaningful lesson that I've learned uh, is kind of what I was just describing. You know, I'm up here in San Jose with my business partner, Lauren, and uh, we own a fashion school together and we were together for five years. And that was, I think my happiest and healthiest mm. relationship. There was, it's definitely flawed in many ways, but that's the first time I really opened my heart. And even like, you know, as an adult told someone that I love them and shit. I mean, this is how twisted I was, dude. I was very, what you'd call in psychological terms or therapeutic terms is a love avoidant. And I even use sex as a way of avoiding intimacy. Like, cool. As long as I'm, I have a few girls that I'm kind of seeing and I'm honest with them and open with them, I don't feel like I'm out of integrity with that. It's like a way for me to have certain needs met, but not really to be vulnerable and open to getting hurt. So at any given time, if any one of them was like, I'm done with you, I'd be like, next. Okay. I don't care. Because right. my heart wasn't, I hadn't let them in. So what I learned in, in I think in that, in, in that main relationship with Lauren and uh, thankfully, we're still great friends. You know, we came up here together to this Tony Robbins thing. It's awesome. We've done a lot of work just to maintain our business relationship and our friendship. But I really learned how unavailable I was, dude. Mm. It's just like I had so much unconscious fear about being left, about being abandoned, about being betrayed, about being hurt, and just being open and being vulnerable and willing to take those arrows. And so since that ended, which was, I don't know, four years ago or something like that, I've had a couple attempts at, at, at intimate relationships in which I really opened my heart, but I wasn't um, wise, I think, in, in the way that I approached the relationship. So the first lesson is, wow, I've been very closed off and I'm really withholding from myself a really rich experience in life, which is allowing myself to deeply love someone and allow someone to deeply love me and to be totally seen you know, like you said, wow, you're authentic. Yeah, I am. I'm real, but I'm only going to let you into a certain point because it gets too scary when you really, really see the real me. Mm-hmm. And and I've done that a couple of times, but I think the error there and the second huge lesson is for me, and this is my own story. I don't proselytize or tell other people how to do it, but the way I enter relationships is cool. You look attractive. Let's fuck around a little bit, see if we have chemistry. Cool, we have chemistry. Let's have sex right away. And if the sex is good, let's build on that. (laughs) You know, the foundation has always been physical. And that might work for some people, but that has not panned out for me in the kind of relationship that I want that has stability. Because what happens for me is... When my hormones are all fired up and that honeymoon period's happening and you're having sex five times a day and it's like you're in that, ah, the newness of it. It's a drug. Yeah, and what happens is it's like I'm fucking Stevie Wonder in the new relationship, bro. I can't see shit. In other words, I don't see the person's character. I don't see their past trauma and if they've dealt with it. Daddy issues, family issues, abandonment issues, addiction issues, psychosis issues, whatever, you know, and... uh I don't know. I think that's that's something that I'm looking forward to when I kind of, you know, uh, get back on the horse, so to speak, is like, wow, I, I really am very committed to approaching relationship in a different way or meet someone, go old school, man, date for a while, really get to know them to see if we are kind of at the same place in life and have the same values. Mm. I think that's the important thing for it's me. It's funny now. How, you, how you're going like old school. You know what I mean? 
like old school conservative, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a reason why those principles are there and they've lasted, you know, the test of time. We're in a very sex positive culture now. And I bought into that. I was like, oh, fuck being monogamous. Dude, I've had like open relationships and all kinds of shit, man. I've been to orgies and everything you can imagine trying to figure out how you do this sex and intimacy mm -hmm. and relationship thing. And none of it has really been satisfactory in the long <clears throat> run. It hasn't been what I really want. Do you think there's a bit of a crisis going on right now with that? Where you see people reverting back to those, those values because it's so sex positive now? There probably is a rubber band whiplash effect going yeah. on. I mean, it's hard for me to see, you know, collectively, but definitely subjectively in my own life. And what's weird is all my homies that are, what are you guys like in your thirties, late thirties, yeah, mid thirties? Yeah. Yeah. All my friends are, I don't think I have, I have a couple friends my age that are late forties, maybe approaching 50, but most of my homies are kind of like eight, 10 years younger than me for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Maybe I'm immature. <laughs> We're on the same wavelength. I, and I really am in many ways. Um, but we're all on the same page. Like, mm -hmm. uh, dude, uh, one of my friends is getting engaged. I mean, he he was intimate fairly quickly, but she's a solid girl. And it was it was apparent she had good values, a good family. You know, she was not not a floozy. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? She's, she's a quality. Not that floozies aren't a quality person, but let's just say she was on the same page in terms of her values, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but like three of my other buddies, they've, they've met girls, they waited, they're taking it slow, they're really getting to know them. It's like we're all, we've talked about it, but everyone's sort of on the same wavelength. It's really interesting. So this is shit my dad's been telling me for 30 years. There's wisdom in that, you know? Yeah. Every time, every time I, you know, oh, dad, oh, I call him whining, crying about the breakup. He's like, I told you, dude. You're thinking with your lower brain. Yeah. You're gonna get the same thing's gonna happen every time. Like, no, this one's different, Dad. You don't understand. It's like, so no, you're, there you're, you go. You're celibate, but you're still open to meeting someone. Not right now. Okay. Not so right now. You're, you're off everything. Yeah. Until until. Um, well, what if it happens? What if you meet someone and it's like, boom. Well, I I don't um I don't get numbers. I don't engage. I don't flirt. So that's okay. not gonna happen. <clears throat> um, it's not because I'm closed my heart or something like mm -hmm. that. It's because. I'm doing a lot of inner work. Mm. Like you said, the, the introspection, I'm dude, I'm looking at my patterns and I'm, I'm really taking time to learn how to be comfortable with myself. I'm, I've been historically very lonely, dude. I mean, I could be around people sometimes, but I still feel alone and afraid. I mean, I'm just being straight up. Mm -hmm. So I sit at home and I'm like, mm, this is uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Where's my phone? Let me text a girl. Let me get a girl over here. And it's like, it's not, even if I'm honest with that girl, quote unquote, and like, hey, this is what it is. It's still pretty empty. And that's not what they really want. They might be like, oh yeah, cool. I'm sex positive. I'm a single young girl. I can do what the fuck I want. Go hook up with this guy. <coughs> Dude, I really don't think that's what anyone really is looking for in the long run because it's such a temporary thing. You know, it's like scratching an itch and then, what if the mosquito bite was gone? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's no itch to scratch. What if I'm contented with being comfortable in solitude and I don't feel lonely or afraid or, you know, my problems are overwhelming me? It's like I really want to build a foundation within myself. And when I feel ready to put myself back on the market, so to speak, I'll really feel like I need to know that I have the self-worth, that I'm comfortable being alone so that I don't become needy and throw my standards out the mm. window or lose my values or my integrity because like I'm lonely and needy or horny or whatever. Mm. It's like, I really want to be a man that can stand on my own two feet and mm. feel like I'm fucking cool with or without. Now let me make a decision from that place of power rather than horniness, loneliness, et cetera. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It yeah. Does. Did you come up with your own strategy? Is this your own strategy or is this something that you've read? Or <laughs> I mean, I think it's just, I, I talk to guys who are doing it right. My dad, you know, I mean, he's on his third marriage, but it's a good one, man. They have a good relationship. They really love one another. They communicate so well. They have so much respect for one another. He cherishes her so much. She respects him so much. Uh, my mentor, Jeff Kober, who's a meditation teacher and an actor in LA, I don't know, he's been married maybe as long as my dad, 15 years or something. They're very happy, very stable. So I talk to the elders, man. I'm like, how are you doing it? Because whatever you got going looks really good about now. Because it used to be, here's the other thing too. I was so afraid of like losing my freedom, bro. And I would be in long-term relationships and just straight up from the first date be like, okay, cool. So seems like we're getting along. Just so you know, I'm not down with monogamy. I'm not going to marry you ever. I'm not going to have kids ever. How's that sound? And they're like, cool, I'll explore that. 
And then after a while, they're like, oh, yeah, no, this isn't working. For me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's not a lot of women in, that aren't very narcissistic or insecure that are going to go along with that for the long haul. So I'm looking at those guys going, wow, man, dude, I've been I've been afraid to commit and settle down because I'm like afraid of losing my freedom. But what does that freedom really get you? It's That's like so you bust true. you bust a nut here mm-hmm. and there. It's like, what the fuck is that? Like very how, true. how mm-hmm. meaningful is that after a while? Whereas mm-hmm. those moments of true connection and intim- intimacy I've had in the past couple of years, there have been a few occasions where I'm like, whoa, this is way more valuable than what I think I'm like giving up. It's a trade-off, but it's it's a worthwhile. It's a right. much deeper uh, level of you know connection, and it's, it's worth it. And, and when you find it, it's totally worth it. But to get it, you have to really love yourself first. Is that mm-hmm. what you're yeah. learning to do? Yeah, exactly, dude. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, I think in, in many ways, and God, this is so, you know, it's weird to say, hopefully... <laughs> you know, it's like to talk about this stuff, you implicate certain people that you've been with, you know, so it's like you kind of have to skirt around a little bit. But I I think because of my own insecurities and my own fears of commitment and things like that, there have been times when I've sold myself short, you know, because my my view of myself, my self valuation has been skewed. <clears throat> and it's also due to the fact that it's skewed because I'm always looking on what I need to work on next. I meet people and they're like, oh my God, dude, you have so much wisdom and experience and you're so awesome. I'm like, what? Yeah, but I can't put my phone down. I'm just looking at my phone addiction and that's how I'm basing my level of development because I'm always looking at the pile of coal yet to be shoveled, not the 400 fucking piles of coal that I've already shoveled in the past however many years. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting because I always feel like, oh man, shit, I got, you know, here's the next thing I need to work on. And the next thing now is really examining my relationship to sex, intimacy, marriage, kids, family, all that. Mm. Going so, through yeah. this whole process, um, have you found like this is part of your purpose now as far as like conveying like what you've gone through and now trying to figure out who you are and how you can sort of pass it on to other people? Yeah, dude, I learned that early on, you know, when I first got sober it was like, put your own seatbelt on, put your own oxygen mask on, like save your own ass, number one, to thine own self be true. So whatever it took for me to just not die was priority number one. But in short order, as I started to become a little more stable, I realized like, ah, the only thing that allows me to keep this uh, consciousness that I'm building, you know, my, my spiritual consciousness, the only thing that allows me to keep that alive and growing and thriving is when I act as a conduit and I'm able to transmit my experiences and my knowledge to other people and to really be of service in a meaningful way. And that's why all, you know, addiction recovery, like what happens at the top of the pyramid when you've kind of arrived? Oh, guess what? Now your ass is going to help other people Mm -hmm. because you've been a selfish motherfucker your whole life, Mm -hmm. you know, and really like in any, I think in, in almost all psychological pathology and addiction at the root of it is just narcissism, extreme selfishness and self-centeredness. And it's, it's because of that survival mechanism, you know, that we all have those instincts of just taken over and it gets down to that core, like me, 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 me. So yeah. And everything that I go through, and it's, it's a great question because this is, this is how I'm able to um, not only survive, but actually really sort of enjoy adversity now, like going through a breakup, having a career issue. It's painful. It sucks. There's times every couple of years where I go through this huge upheaval. But dude, I know that in there are nuggets of wisdom and experience that are really valuable for me to be able to help other people to go through. And so I guess, you know, it's probably why a lot of my friends are younger. You know, I don't want to say like, oh, I'm the leader of the group or something. It's kind of weird, but I am older and I am sort of the guy that a lot of my buddies go to. With shit You've like been this. through a lot. Dude. I have. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I have. Lot. I've been through a lot of shit. And, and, and also there's things that I learned from them. I mean, my friend James that's engaged now, I'm like, how do you do it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you guys don't fight. Whoa. You know, it's like I give him tips and he gives me tips. So it's a two way thing. But, I mean, dude, if there was like one takeaway, how do you have a happy, meaningful life? It's like, you got to serve, man. And that's Mm -hmm. what's so great about having my podcast is I'm sure you guys know Mm -hmm. is all I really do now is produce content that educates and inspires people to, um, to achieve (coughs) more well-being, you know, a a more peaceful mind, a a spiritual connection, whatever that looks like for people. Was that the main motivation? Was that the main motivation for the podcast? Yeah, dude. I just, I have so much to share and I'm also just 
I'm so committed to learning more and growing more myself. So the podcast is like, what a great medium for both of those, right? Yeah, dude. It's it's also just like I game the system and I get to talk to some of the most brilliant people on the planet that yep. would maybe never yep. talk to me if there wasn't a microphone between us, you know? So it's like I started to realize early on, I was like, oh, shit. When you have a show, you can get access to really brilliant people. And so now I get to sit down with people. And when I, I think that's why my show has been successful is because I only have people on that I'm really, really interested in in learning from like you guys, when you guys came on my show, it's like, you, you know, your people reached out, Hey, these guys are going to be in LA. They want to do shows. Like, let me check them out. I was like, Oh, these guys have something I want to know about. Like fitness has not been my area of expertise in my life. So let's talk about that and get the real deal. And we had a great show and I learned a shitload from you guys. I could have gone off. Oh, I need to get testosterone or I used to shoot HGH in my belly. You guys are like, nah. I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, whatever ketosis, whatever shit we talked about, I'm literally asking you guys questions because I want to know the answer. And so that passion that I have to learn and to grow translates to the audience and they get, you know, there's a certain, um, uh, magnetism to passion. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I, we've said this so many times on the show. I, podcasting is so therapeutic. I went through some of the most difficult times in my life uh, when we started Mind Pump. I went through a divorce after a 15-year marriage and I being on the podcast is a big reason why I was able to, uh, I guess, process through all that. And so my, 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 my question to you is, do you find that same therapeutic value from, from, from podcasting yourself? Do you see the, the, do you get that kind of value from it? Do you get the therapy from talking to these guests and being able to share your story or listening to your own story back? You know, like I, I, a lot of times I'll do an episode and I go back and I'm like, I hear myself say something. I'm like, do you really believe that? Is that how you feel? And like Mm -hmm. question what I'm saying. I think, I think it's a, it's great for that. Have you felt that? Absolutely, dude. I mean, I'm, I'm not just interviewing the people. I'm a student and I really apply what they talk about. Like one of the, in terms of relationships, one guest that's been on twice that I've learned so much from is John Gray, the author of uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Oh, right. Yeah. And, you know, I remember that seeing that book around when I was uh, maybe a teenager or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was like, ah, it's for old people. Right. I was right. like, ah, whatever. I mean, I never had any reason to read it. Dude, I mean, I've learned so much from him. It has been like a therapy session because I'm asking questions that are relevant to my mm-hmm. to my life. I'm never like, oh, I wonder what the audience wants to hear. Let me play to them, like play to the crowd kind of thing. I'm like, that never works. When you play music... You got to play the set that you want to play, that you feel. You can't play the set mm-hmm. that, you oh, they want. You got to throw That's in a, a couple point. hits, but yeah. it's like, you know, who was that that said, uh, oh, man. Oh, David Bowie. It goes back to that thing. David Bowie, uh, there was an interview with him shortly before he died, and it said, you know, if you could change anything you've done in your career, what would it be? And he said, immediately, he said, playing to the audience. Mm-hmm. You know, those shows where I played or put on an album according to what the market wanted or what the fans wanted rather than like what I felt and what I was passionate about, you know? So that's how mm-hmm. the interviews are Stay to me. Stay authentic, man. <clears throat> yeah, that's how the interviews are to me is like when I sit down and formulate my questions, it's like when I interviewed you guys, like, well, what do I really want to know? If I could sit down with these guys with no microphones and I want to extrapolate all the knowledge you guys have mm-hmm put together in all the years you've been doing this and fitness and wellness and all the stuff you're up to, like, what do I really want to know? So it, it is like a therapy session and a lesson for me first have, and foremost. Have you recorded any podcasts where afterwards you listen to it and you go, Oh shit. Like I sound like that. What did I say there? And where you kind of reveal things to yourself after the fact? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen to every one of my shows because I'm always looking to improve. One of the things I've been working on, for example, is not swearing so much. Your guys' show, you guys seem to swear a lot. <laughs> I'm like, cool, I'm going to cut loose. I'll probably like double swear in this. But in my delivery and learning how to be concise and not say, um, you know, like mm. all that shit, filler words to really get better at the delivery. So I do listen back to them and also interviews I do, I listen back to for the same reason. And it is interesting to watch the if evolution I can, of that? Yeah, if I can step Oh, you're, out. you're already way sharper since the last time we've seen you. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Keep... So maybe it's the psilocybin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like laughing. Well, you got a lot of shows under your belt now. I do. I, mean, I do. I, mean, I don't know how, how many you had at that point, that point when we got linked up the first time. Yeah, how you... long have you been on air now? It'll be two years, June 6th. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, for us, I think the big, it was like after a year, there was a huge growth spurt in our talent or I guess our ability. Yeah. And then it was like the... Th- after the second year, there was another big growth spurt where I just noticed we're so much better. 
Yeah. Are you noticing that with yourself where you just go through these periods where you're like, whoa, I'm way better. I think so. And I also, I also take the feedback that I get, if any of it is ever critical, of course, most people that are going to take the time to reach out and be like, you're awesome. Don't change a thing. Someone doesn't like it. They're just like, what is this shit? And they just probably turn it off. They're not going to be motivated to like critique you. But can you share some of those criticisms? Yeah. I always get the same one. What? Uh, which is probably relevant even here, here today because you asked me a question, I go on for 45 minutes. Yeah. I get, I get, you know, I was like, I just, dude, it, it I, works with mind pump because I catch you, you doing that, and I just interrupt you. Yeah, that's so, good. I got you. I got your back. That's dude. good. Yeah. Um, the, the, the uh, negative criticism I've gotten has been that I interrupt my guests too much mm. and that I talk too much about myself and I don't like let them just rant because I'll often, I'll often relate a question to a story in my own life. So if I was interviewing you it's guys- because how you learn. Yeah, if I was interviewing you guys about something fitness related, I'd be like, hey, you guys, you know, uh, I, I can't really do bench presses anymore because I've lost mobility in my left shoulder. I have like, I don't know, do you think it's a torn ligament or da, da, da? What would you recommend about this? Because this is what happens to me, 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 me. Mm. And I might like have a 30 second question that tells a story about how I injured my shoulder in high school or some shit. But that's my way of asking the question. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So that's something that I'm I'm working on improving is being more concise in the questions and really allowing the guests some breathing room. But here's what people don't fucking understand, you people that have <laughs> criticized me, <laughs> motherfuckers, <laughs> is that <laughs> is that and you guys I'm sure have noticed this, sometimes with some guests, their energy's low oh, yeah. and they're not experts at being interviewed and it's like you really got to pull teeth keep priming them the whole time yeah and so the audience doesn't know like what's going on to me i'm like oh this is really boring shit and so i add my energy and my personality and charisma to the mix Mm -hmm. to try and like bring it out of them and just to make the show which is probably a pretty good strategy Uh, because we all have had had guests like that it's a lot harder than people think yeah it reminds me of when people watch like a fight a ufc fight they're like just punch him (laughs) what the fuck it's, right right there, man. Yeah. 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 it's totally. a lot harder than you think it is that, man. that's hilarious dude yeah, yeah and we have each other to rely on so if we have a guest that's a shit guest we'll just start we'll talking, start to, talking to ourselves yeah we'll just yeah. start talking because we've got that down yeah. because there's three of us but right. being solo that's a lot of pressure and that's right. all your only option is that like I could tell a story you know what I'm saying so, who's been your most sure. difficult guest um well, I can't say that. <laughs> okay, well, just, just, describe, uh, to say describe names, no, right? No, you know, you know what it is. Sometimes is uh, the one the ones that are I think more like that are just personalities that I interview that are very knowledgeable and have a lot of wisdom, but they're sort of just introverted people, yeah. or they're very scientific. And, you know, they can write an amazing white paper on XYZ biohacking technology or whatever, but they're not necessarily a public speaker. They just happen to be the spokesperson for their company because they've invented some device or whatever. They're the only go to. And I want to learn about that one um, niche product or something like that, you know, so. Well, I'll flip it then. Who's been your your best guest Um, or your favorite (laughs) besides us? Uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, mind pump. Um, <clears throat> let me see. God, you know, since I cover sort of the physical and metaphysical, mm-hmm. I mean, I have some great minds that are more on in the health space. And then I have some that are more in the spiritual or psychological. I mean, honestly, I think John Gray is still, I already mentioned yeah. him, but that's, he's been on twice, as I said, and he, he's one of my favorites just because He's an older guy and he's just so knowledgeable about so many things. I mean, you can go down any rabbit hole with homie and he just like, it's never ending cool. supply of, uh, of knowledge. And he just got a really good heart. He's just a really sweet, kind person and is also very intelligent. He's also very humble. You know, it's cool when you meet someone who has a, a vast well of wisdom, but also doesn't take themselves too seriously. I find that to be a really mm-hmm. attractive quality. Um, let me see who else has been. God, there's been so many rad ones, dude. I think on the more spiritual level, one of my favorites was my teacher, Jeff Kober. We did a really long, like two hour episode. And, uh, you know, he's been meditating for 30 freaking years or something like that. And he's just on another level. But he's also, again, very relatable and is able to describe some pretty esoteric concepts mm. and ideas in a way where you're like, oh, I get that. I can do that. Mm. And that one was very meaningful to me. Also, just because he's been really helpful. He taught me how to meditate in a new way, like six six years ago, Vedic meditation. And that was really good. Um, I have one, actually. I'll give one more. 
I have one coming out uh, next Tuesday, actually, with Daniel Vitalis, who's a friend of mine. And he's been on the show two other times. But in this particular episode, we did a three hour, and this is going to sound crazy. We did a three hour interview all about water. What? Yeah, just all about water. All of the different options for drinking water, bathing <coughs> water, what water is, what it does, filters, spring water, the whole like water kind of the whole topic. I mean, three hours isn't even enough to talk about something so weird and mysterious. We just kind of take water for, oh yeah, give me a glass of water. Not all water is created equal and we don't even really scientifically kind of know what it is. There's this fourth phase of water, for example. Yeah, Uh, give us a little sneak sneak peek. Well, you know, basically what fourth phase of water is (laughs) called exclusion zone water. I don't know if it was discovered by, but uh, there's a guy named Gerald Pollack who wrote a book called The Fourth Phase of Water and we know about uh, gas, solid, and liquid Mm -hmm. water. There's a fourth phase, which is gel water. It's really trippy. I have a device called a Nano V. Actually, it's in my car. I drive around with it mm-hmm. and it makes this fourth phase of water and you inhale it. It's another whole <laughs> what? what the fuck are you doing with it? You're are, drunk. You, are you smoking water? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing, dude. I gave up drugs and everyone's always like, uh, do you realize you're addicted to all this biohacking shit? I'm like, yeah, obviously. That's a good question. Do you find yourself trading one for the other? Yeah, absolutely. I do. But I think the thing that lets me get away with that is the fact that I am self-aware about yeah. it. Right. And I see that I have attachments to mm-hmm. all of this shit. I mean, if you see my hotel room, dude, it's like, I mean, it's ridiculous. The amount of gear I have in there and just all this shit, just to to be the best me that I can be today showing up for this and the Tony Robbins thing. Like, there's a bunch of shit that I carry around and use. Um, so, yeah, I think that it, I have substituted that to a degree. What was the first part of your question? Uh, God, I don't even remember. Well, yeah. Luke, I wanted to ask you, yeah. do you, have, do you still get moments uh, – in your life where you almost feel triggered to want to go back and, and do drugs and what, and have you uh, been able to pinpoint what those triggers are? Oh man, I've, you know, I've, I alluded to this earlier. I mentioned that I had this spiritual experience, right. you know, when I was 26 and it, it, it's true. I, the, the day I checked into rehab, I was totally hammered when I went in there. It was in Sebastopol up in Sonoma County, a couple hours from here. And uh, the next morning I woke up and I started, I didn't know what else to do. This is the only information I was given in terms of tools at that time to just survive that first few days. And they said, well, you do this thing. It's called prayer. You know? I was like, well, what the fuck is that? Mm. Pray? That's what you, can you guys give me some Dilaudid or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, I'm not interested in prayer. Do you have another solution? Because <laughs> I'm in withdrawal, you know? But I, st- I, I did, man. I was so desperate. And I was like, oh, this is so stupid. Oh, my God. I can't believe I'm fucking doing this. And I like get at the foot of the bed, put my hands together. Get oh, shit. Knees. That's crazy that you actually went all the way <laughs> yeah. to down to your knees praying. I only had seen it in the movies. Right. I mean, that's like. What did you experience when you did that? What I experienced, yeah. dude, is what I'm experiencing right now from that moment until now is wow. the presence of God in my life. Did you feel it? Did you see something? What was it? No. Unfortunately, there wasn't a rad thing like poof, the windows yeah, blew yeah. open and the curtains, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, light. Trees on yeah. fire. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Trees on fire. Luke, this is God. You're good to go. You're yeah. sober. Um, no, I got you know, you, buddy. Yeah, what happened was, man, um, that I just, the craving, you know, to your question, the, the constant nagging, just like, oh my God, it's like, if anyone has not been addicted to drugs, it's almost like, it's like when you're hangry, you know, when you are really, really hungry or you're, you know, imagine being out in the desert and you haven't had water for two days. It's just like, oh my God, give me anything. My soul is on fire, you know? And there was that constant nagging and that just went away. Whoa. It just was gone and it's never come back. That's why I don't trip. Like, I mean, I don't, None of my friends were like smoke weed all the time. They're not drunk. I mean, I'm not around people that are hammered and like mm-hmm. doing hard drugs and stuff like that. But I never once have been triggered. I played in bands for 15 years after I was sober. I've been on tour. I was going to ask you about that, being around music and your association with that and having like spiritual kind of moments with that. Like how hard has that been? Not at all, dude. Not at all. Because um, it's funny, like, these mic stands. Like, I know, oh, bro. Right, like, <laughs> right in the I middle of your face. You. I'm like, okay, I could have eye contact <laughs> if I turn sideways. Um, no, you know, man, because I think some people that end up sobering up aren't ready yet. And that's why they go back and forth, back Mm -hmm. and forth. And some of them never get it. I mean, the history books are full of prominent people who just couldn't get it. Like Scott Weiland, you know, Stone Temple Pilots. Fucking dude, just couldn't get it. Tragic. He's dead, you know, and there's so many of those. I think for me, I I always knew that eventually I was going to quit that shit, you know? 
it was just, I had to wait until I was really, really, really ready. And when I was finally ready, I was ready. And so, you know, when I started playing in bands and stuff, when I was first sober, it's just, it's just not an option. Mm -hmm. I just know what, I know what happens when I touch that shit. It's, it's, it's a very repeatable experiment. Mm. And I described the cascade of, you know, tragedy before. What happens? Oh, I smoke a little weed, then this, then that, then that. It's like literally like setting up some fucking dominoes and you think you're hitting the first one down, but you know that like <laughs> that train of dominoes that goes across the room, you know, eventually it's going to hit that last one down. My last domino was down, bro. And it's just, I'm done. Have, so have you helped anybody fun. else? Uh, become sober? Oh yeah, tons, man, tons. I mean, that's that's my lifeblood, dude. That's really? the thing that matters. Yeah. Uh, what do you? What kind of advice? Maybe we have someone listening right now. That's you know, you might be striking a chord, and I hope so. I hope we are. Yeah. What, what kind of advice could you give somebody? Well, I think first you got to define, you know, when when you're addicted and when you're just a heavy user. I mean, I know people that drink quite a bit here and there. They do drugs occasionally and like they control it. It doesn't control them and they can do that their whole life. And then some people are in control for a while and then whoosh, the tables turn and that shit has you. So to me, defining addiction would be something that continually has, you know, negative consequences and you literally in and of yourself don't have the power to stop. Mm -hmm. So if someone finds themselves in that situation where they're losing relationships and family and, you know, their health and their, their vocation and things like that. I mean, if your life's falling apart, I think the number one thing that worked for me was just getting help, professional help, dude. Because I tried to do it my own little way. Like I said, all right, this week I'm just going to smoke weed. You know, it's like, okay, that lasts about four hours, you know, and then someone's want a beer. I'm like, yeah, it'll be fine. You know, it's, it's really getting some help, whatever that looks like. You know, for me, it was just a clear cut decision, check myself in somewhere, mm -hmm. be sequestered away mm -hmm. from society and temptation for, um, for, uh, you know, 28 days. And that gave me a little head start. Then I could ease back into society. Yeah. Maybe in the first couple of months, I wasn't going to bars or hang, you know, going to a concert where people are blazing weed. Like I was, I removed myself to a degree, but because I had that support system in that community and I got really involved in recovery, uh, you know, I think that's what got me. So it's like professional help and also just, you know, honestly, just going to meetings and kind of doing that thing. I think some people have a hard time with that because they have preconceived ideas mm -hmm. about it. But I'll tell you what, dude, addiction looks like a physical problem, but it's really a spiritual problem. There's a hole in your soul, man, that you're trying to fill. And so whether that looks like religion, you know, yogic practices, meditation, 12-step uh, recovery groups, however. But I've never personally, let me think if, I, if this is really true. Yeah, I can't recall in 21 years anyone that's a bona fide addict, not someone that like kind of got a little squirrely for a while and then reeled it back in, but someone who's like ride or die. I've never seen someone recover on their own unaided will, on their own resources. They've always had to have some sort of spiritual framework of living mm -hmm. because it's it's about the core. It's about <clears throat> what the, the reason that I feel so uncomfortable that I need other shit to make me feel comfortable. So yeah, first you got to get rid of the symptom. The symptom would be I drink too much, okay? But what's the cause? The cause is I hate myself. The cause is I still hate other people. I resent, you know, my uncle or, you know, whatever. It's like, it's that shit that tears you up inside or just being constantly full of anxiety and depression and all those things. It's like the self-medicating. What you're saying is resonating so strongly because, uh, you know, being in fitness for as long as, as we have, we, we, we don't deal with addiction with drugs, but we deal a lot with food addiction, oh, uh, addiction sure. to lifestyles that also have terrible consequences. You know, people who end up with heart disease or diabetes or severe obesity, which is, which also can be very crippling, maybe not so acutely, but over time right. can be quite terrible. And you know, uh, what you're saying resonates because you, it's almost like people are like, Oh, if I just lose weight, I'll be happy, but you got to be happy first, or at least feel that peace before. And then that's what causes the weight loss. So that's what causes the, the addiction to, you know, to dissipate or at least give you the strength to deal with the addiction. And so it's, it's funny what you're saying is, I mean, when you're talking about drugs, it's so acute, right? It's so like, and food is so accepted, but it's very similar. You're feeling something and yeah. you need to fill that hole with something else. Otherwise it's always going to feel empty. 
Exactly, dude. That's the thing. It's a symptom. So overeating. Um, I mean, that, you know, here's the thing too. When I quit doing drugs, and this goes back, to, am I addicted to biohacking and supplements and all this shit? It's like, yeah, but it's good for you, so it's easy to excuse. Yeah, but yeah. dude, when I got sober, I mean, I went ham on, on porn and sure. cigarettes, and I, dude, I used to go to Seven Eleven every night and get two pints of Haagen Dazs and just sit there. I mean, mm. I'm a thin guy, and I've never mm. been obese, thankfully, but. I mean, I should be by the way that I, I mm-hmm. used food and sugar, like you mentioned, dopamine, like mm-hmm. any, we didn't have cell phones back when I got sober or maybe they had just come out, but definitely they didn't do what they do now. So I, I, I used everything, got addicted to everything else. And then over the years, I've had to learn how to stop all those things, but it's not even about quitting the behavior. Like you say, it's addressing the underlying issues and the behavior sort of stops mm-hmm. just over the years for me, pornography, for example, which I fucking love. I wish I could do it all the time. It's yeah. amazing. You know, it feels really good. Yeah. It's exciting. Uh, I agree. But over the years, <laughs> <laughs> but over the uh, years, it's just like, oh man, I don't like the feeling that I get from it the next day or afterward. It's sort of like, Ugh, I feel depleted and kind of weird. And I can't look the girl in the eyes that working at Starbucks. I just, <clears throat> it's like, doesn't resonate with me anymore. And so that sort of fallen out of my, well, now it is completely out of my life, but it, it just gradually sort of fell away, the addictive propensity toward that thing. Not because I was like, I need to quit porn and then I'll be okay. It's more like I've done things to be okay. And then porn just kind of falls away. It, it's doesn't, weird, right? it doesn't resonate with me anymore. Same yeah. with smoking cigarettes or, you know, really abusing sugar or food or anything like that. How are you handling the the cell phone addiction? How's that going? That's that's a challenge for me, dude. You know, I'll be totally honest, man. I am on that thing a lot more than I would like to be. It's easy to justify because you have a business revolving. That's around, the right? thing. You know, people are like, dude, just get rid of you know mm-hmm. social media. It's like, well, I mean, I could. <laughs> I probably could still pay my bills by not having an Instagram, but I don't. I think what I do is so personal too it's not like a brand like say i own a gym i could hire a social media person and they could like you know show the workouts and highlight clients and shit like that but like my brand is my lifestyle and everything that i do on the way over here today hey i'm headed to mind pump this is what we're going to be up to it's like there's no way for someone else to really do my social media for me so it's like do i let it go and it's it's very much like food it's one of those things or like food addiction sex addiction social media addiction addiction. device addiction Mm -hmm. It's tricky because it's not black or white. You can't stop eating and it's right. probably not. There's no cold turkey with food. Yeah. It's, 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 we call it, uh, what do they say? Like, um, uh, you know, it's like you got to ride the tiger. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like sex addiction. I mean, I think I've behaved definitely sexually in my life in ways that are very addictive. I've done things that I don't really want to do just because I'm compelled to do it. And later on, I'm like, oh God, why did I do that? This isn't really in alignment with my values or whatever but I'm not going to not have sex forever mm-hmm. and I'm not going to not have an Instagram account. Like right. I got to have it. But that I think is probably the most, aside from all the health shit that I do, to be honest, but as far as social media, Instagram, like I really only need to post one thing a day, maybe a couple of stories. But whenever I see my phone, I'm like, refresh, 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 yep, yep. you know? And it's like, why the fuck am I doing that? Right. Yeah. It's annoying, <clears throat> but I literally can't stop. Yeah. Right now. Do you, did you know that like uh, Instagram releases your likes to you with an algorithm? So it's not literally like how you get it. So for example, like let's say a picture of yours <coughs> averages 300 likes a picture or something and you hit, you post it up and then 20 minutes go by and you're curious. And so you pick your phone back up and boom, 50 likes already. And then you put it back down. Let's say between the time you put it back down at 20 minutes goes by and you want to pick it up again, you get 50 likes again. They feed you 25 likes and they hold that other 25 so they can drip it to you every time you refresh and come back. They're training you oh, to do that. Ah, damn. How and cr- those bastards are all from this area. Yeah. And, and <laughs> we're in the epicenter of that and shit. And they don't let their kids fucking play on that shit. Right. I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. They put all kinds yeah. of crazy restrictions. Oh, I've limited my kids on, on, yeah. on devices because I the way I view uh, technology today is the same way that, you know, I view like processed foods when we were kids. Like when we were kids, processed foods started getting really popular and there really were no... Nobody really governed it for kids. So like for breakfast, you have your, your Eggo waffle. And for lunch, you had your, you know, your sandwich with your processed, you know, whatever. And, you know, your snacks and whatever. And now we're seeing this obesity epidemic. So now people are like, oh, no, you got to feed your kids differently. It's going to be like that with tech. Nobody knows yet. Like everybody's yeah. like, they give the iPad to their kid. They leave them in the corner. And we're going to see in about 15 <laughs> to 20 years. Like, I call it the iPad nanny. 
Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, here's the other thing about the devices, bro. It's not even the psychological implications, but the fucking blue light and the EMFs. Like oh, when I see a kid sitting there with a, oh, yeah. an iPad, I'm like, dude, it's like Wi-Fi to the dome. If you had an EMF, I mean, even in the studio, if you had an EMF meter, not to get tinfoil hat, but there's science to back up the fact that it affects mm-hmm. your biology negatively. If you ran an EMF meter here, it's like, doo, 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 the shit is on fire with EMF, yep, yep. you know, and every device, I mean, even having this right here, having my phone a foot away and having it two feet away is like a 200% decrease yep. in the amount of EMF. So I'm like, God, when are we going to figure out how to make signals that carry information and data well, that once actually a, don't hurt you? Once the market has pressure, because we, we start to see the actual results of the negative. Right. You know, it then, then it'll start to, it, yeah. It's like Apple eventually <clears throat> put in their little fake ass blue light filter, which doesn't hardly do anything, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, you know, yeah. it does limit a certain. Oh, have you heard it doesn't do very much? I mean, that fucks me up. Well, dude, no, don't no, tell me that. no, it's good. It, it's good. <laughs> I was feeling good about myself for making sure I had that turned on as soon as the sun goes down. No, it's it's good, dude. It's good. Um, I can show you a hack on your phone that'll make it all red. Oh, really? Yeah, it's cool. It's an accessibility. It's really hard to get to. And every time I try to show someone, I forget. But um, one of these days, I'm going to make a post and like so I can just point people to it. No, the night shift, is it's an improvement. It's better than nothing. But with blue light, and I've interviewed a lot of super geeky PhD people on this topic specifically, you know, the wavelength of light that the sun produces is a vast uh, spectrum of light, you know, from um, infrared, invisible to purple to red, green, yellow, every color of the rainbow is inherent to natural sunlight, right? And at different times of day, there's different spectrums of that light. So what they've done is they've cut out the gnarliest, really negative, uh, the deleterious blue light, like the lights in your studio lights Mm -hmm. right here. Those are like a totally unnatural wavelength of blue light that the sun never produces. The sun's never just pure, pure blue like that. There's always a little bit of violet, you know, uh, or mm-hmm. or um, red or something like that to offset it. So the night shift is decent, but here's the difference is that you're still going to have your melatonin production decreased even with night shift because there still is a bit of blue and a bit of green. It's just not going to hurt your eyes or totally shut down your melatonin like that pure blue light. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's an, but it's cool. At least Apple acknowledged like, oh, this is a problem. We're going to take a step. And the new phones do have the capacity to turn off the blue light 100% and literally make it red which is the spectrum of, you know, fire, obviously. We've so. talked a little bit about this on the show, but we should dive deeper because this is pretty fascinating. Yeah. What are some of the what are some of the biggest changes you've made in your life based on an interview that you've done with your show? Like, have you interviewed someone and been like, oh shit, I need to change this thing? The blue light thing <clears throat> has been huge, yeah. Uh, interviewing a guy named Dr. Dr. Jack Cruz, specifically. He's a neurosurgeon, I mean, he's a brain surgeon. If you're gonna talk to someone, make sure they've got some credentials, you know, mm-hmm. before you start, you know, turn off all your lights at night. But he's a guy that's, I mean, he's very extreme into light and the damages of that and Wi-Fi. Um, so... I made subtle changes like, oh, cool, I'll use night shift. And he's like, yeah, bro, that's not going to cut it. So he's one that's had a huge impact where, you know, it's almost, to me, equal to the food you eat is like how your lighting is. So Wow, that big of an impact, you said. Yeah, it's huge, man, because it affects your circadian <laughs> rhythm and your and your hormones and your neurotransmitters. And then those have a cascade effect on your mitochondria and your mm. metabolism and everything. So it's really crazy. For me, I'm just like an earth child hippie dude, right? So... I just think about, okay, what makes sense biologically? I sort of have a paleolithic approach to everything, not just food, but well, let me think, have a paleo approach to lighting. Okay, we've evolved at least a couple hundred thousand years, if not say two million years to, you know, rise and wake with the sun. We follow the sun. I mean, all of the ancient cultures, everything they build, every structure is all about the sun. It's all about Mm -hmm. astrology, right? About, what, 100 years ago, whenever 125 years ago, when the incandescent light bulb was invented, thank God, now we can make sun at night. Mm -hmm. And so that was great. But we have not evolved to have sun at night. Our eyes send messages to our brain and our whole biology that indicate what's going on in the environment and what time it is. So if you were in here at midnight under these blue studio lights, your brain thinks it's noon. That fucks you up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the bottom line. We've evolved to be in front of a fire after the sun goes down. Maybe there's moonlight that's bright. You know, it's a reflection of the sun. There's a little blue light there. There's stars. But for the most part, once it gets dark, it sends a signal to our body, start making melatonin. Mm -hmm. I've got these red glasses. They're 
douchey as fuck, but they're, I mean, they're just... You, I love that you admit that. At least that. you call yeah. yourself yeah. out on that. Yeah, That's I awesome. mean, you are not going to get laid in these glasses, <laughs> but you'll sleep like a beast. Yeah. Um, and they cut out all the blue and all the green. And it's crazy when you put those things on and then at night and then you take them off, you're like, oh my God, yep. you really notice all the green and blue spectrums yeah. of light. But that's really, we've evolved at night to only see a little fire and it starts mm-hmm. to wind down. What's crazy is the minute you put those glasses on, you stop producing cortisol and you immediately start producing melatonin. And then if you took them off and looked at the blue light again, you get a cortisol spike. I mean, this is science. It's not Dude, shit. In, in my house, we turn the lights off and go by candlelight. When the, when oh, that's amazing. And, and I, yeah. So I did that because I have my kids with me half time and yeah. I noticed that they'd have a tough time going to sleep or whatever. And, you know, obviously because of our podcast, we talk about all these different things. So we did an experiment and we started turning off the lights and going by candlelight. And my kids go, they go to bed right at bedtime. Like they want to go to bed. They sleep really well. And then I started sleeping even better, even though I thought I had good sleep before. So it makes a huge impact. Actually, That's cool. Yeah, it makes a massive impact. Kids are a good experiment for something like that because they're just inherently more natural, I think, because their biology is is has been in the environment fewer years. Yep. You know, so you can see effects like that. Whereas we have adaptation. You and I, we've been adapting this shit for 30, mm-hmm. whatever, 40 something years. Uh, when it gets dark, oh, you have the ability to flip the light switch. And so we have kind of adapted, but it's a negative adaptation. It's not a positive adaptation right. to learn how to be unnatural. So I don't, I don't have the candle thing on lock. What I did in my place, and this might be useful. If you go on Amazon, you can search for red or amber bulbs. And I prefer incandescent bulbs. If you can find them, they're a little hard to find because of the legality of it. Uh, environmental issues and energy usage and shit like that. LEDs use less energy. That's why they phased out incandescent, the old school bulbs. <coughs> But anyway, what I do is in my house, I have like one whole set of lighting at night that's the night lighting. It's all amber and red. And then there's other switches that turn on the bright, normal, like blue full spectrum lights. So I just know if I go in the bathroom, I only hit the bottom switch because that's the amber vanity lights. And I'd never hit that other one at night. It's, it's this bright, So that's super how Ben Greenfield has his house. I know, I know. That's what I'm thinking right now. Like, yeah. No wonder his house was, because we're in there at night and it's all red. And I'm like, this is weird. Yeah. 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 But you know, what's crazy, dude, is you get used to it. It's I've been doing that for years now. And people come over and they come in, they're like, wow, it feels really good. There's really good energy or it's a good vibe. And you know, maybe it's because I meditate a lot in there or some mm-hmm. shit. But what they don't realize, it's no, I've hacked the lighting. So their biology is going... Ah, oh, this right. is what night is supposed to look and feel like. It feels like fire, you know? Relaxing. But yeah, dude, because it's, I mean, you stop producing cortisol, right? Unless, mm-hmm. you know, somebody tries to whack you or something. You can produce it without light, but it's it's uh, it stops producing it. And then what's crazy is if in my house, I accidentally hit one of those other switches, I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm <laughs> melting. Like it's, a vampire. Yeah, dude, it's <laughs> yeah. so bright. You're like, holy shit, you really get used to I it. I got a question for you, Luke, because you, you've you been meditating as part of your spiritual practice for a long time now, right? Yeah, 20, 20 something years, sure. So can we maybe give some tips to our audience about meditation for someone, you know, just getting into it? How long should they, what does it look like? What are some good practices? When's the best time to meditate? You know? Oh yeah, for sure, dude. I mean- <clears throat> Oh God, if you like said, ah, what's the number one hack, you know, if someone is not religious or spiritual and they don't want to get too woo woo and they're not going to go live in a cave or something like, dude, I don't think any human being (laughs) can really achieve a high degree of stability and mental health in this world without taking that time for yourself to meditate, however that looks. So in terms of a lifestyle practice, I mean, honestly, and I'm not even shitting you guys. If you right now offered me a billion dollars cash, a room this size, full of cash, no strings attached, and you said, but you can never meditate ever again for the rest of your life, I would not even fucking hesitate to turn it down. Wow, really? Oh, dude. There's just, there's nothing, it's invaluable. Is that because it's opened so many doors for you? Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's the sweetest moment of my day. I meditated this morning for 30 minutes right before I came here. It's like that has become just, oh, I just value it so highly because that's the time that I use to really get in touch with who and what I really am beyond the sensations of the body, the cravings of the body, the chatter of the mind, the emotions, the feelings, the memories, the anticipation of the future, all the thinking and feeling. What does that, what does that space look like? (laughs) Well, what it is, is that there's a gap of separation between who I am, which is a soul. It's not like you have a soul. You are a soul. 
and and so are you, and so are you, and so are you. Some people just have varying degrees of awareness and connection to what and who they really are. This is just my world view. Someone might disagree and say, mm-hmm. no, we are just a piece of meat with a computer inside our skull. And that's one point of view, which, hey, maybe it's right. I don't know. For me, what makes life work and be meaningful is to identify that I'm not this body, I'm not these thoughts, I'm not these emotions, and meditation is a means by which to practice, and that's why it's called a practice. It's it's like practicing piano, practicing guitar. Because yeah, it's hard at first. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to give you some practical tips, yes, too. Yes, please. You know, for sure, but yes, just yes. to create the context as, well, why would I bother taking those tips? That space looks like that I live a lot of my waking hours with an awareness that I'm the one watching all of the phenomena of my personality, of my ego, of my feelings, of pain, of pleasure, of all that, that there's an awareness that's sort of outside of that watching it all take place. And so as I sit here and have a conversation with you guys, there's me, my personality, but there's also an awareness of this fucking Luke guy sitting here talking. It's hard to explain. Does that make sense? It's right. like you're the observer. Yeah, yeah. It's you know they call it the witness and things like that. But at a, at a certain stage, it's almost like there's no separation between all of it. It's not even like oh, I'm over here kind of watching from above in this room, having some outer body experience, and there's a soul me and a body me and a personality me and you and you. It all becomes one thing where the observer and the thing being observed are just part of the same phenomenon. I mean, it's a, it's a little out there, you know, I admit, but that's what it's like for me subjectively. So yesterday when I was driving up here, for example, just to give you a benefit of meditation, I fucking put in the wrong Sheridan four points. I didn't know there was two. I just put in ways when I left. I was like, four points, San Jose, click. And I was fucking, I'm on my way. And then we, we, I accidentally got off the freeway right around here by the Tony Robbins center, you know, whatever sap shit down the street. And I was like, oh, there's the thing. And I was like, wait, the fucking Waze is taking us another 15 minutes up the highway here toward the airport one. And then I and I said to uh, my partner, Laura, I was like, oh, this is right when we got here. I was like, oh, this is sick. We got no traffic the whole way. This is dope. Totally jinxed us. Then I take the wrong exit and we're just like in this traffic. And I got super irritated and pissed off because I hate being, two things I hate, being lost and backtracking. I can't stand like, you know, when you run errands, I just have this OCD thing. I have to do it in order. I can't like go north, then go back south, then go north again. That fucking drives that, me nuts. That's the thing from living in LA. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. an LA person thing because yeah. when you live in LA, that's a huge mistake. <laughs> dude, that could be a four hour mistake. Yeah. Dude, there. So what that looks like, you know, to your question, what does that gap look like? It's not some, you know, mystical play. Although there are mystical experiences too. Like this morning, dude, I went into this deep space of just, empty black space where there was no thoughts. And I was just, I would touch on it just periodically during my meditation. And it's literally like you're in outer space and there's just absolute stillness and quiet. And there's not even a me, there's no anything else. It's just a oneness feeling. And those are those sweet glimpses. How does that work in daily life? I get super pissed off. Like, oh, God damn it. And I got irritated like a human would. I've got, I still have an animal body that gets frustrated. I'm trapped in the car for five and a half hours. But because of all these years of meditation, I was actually able to see, oh, look, you're getting all pissy and irritable now. Look at you, Luke. I'm watching myself. And then I just was able to let it go and not have my whole night ruined and be a dick to my partner and like, you know, be grumpy when I check in the hotel and like have a be a big fucking drama queen. I was just like, oh, okay, now is me playing irritated game. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Breathe a little bit, breathe. And then it was just all over, you know, dude, something like that used to happen to me and it would take me over for a few, it would like cascade thoughts and feelings of negativity <laughs> for days or weeks. Yeah. I mean, just, I'd get triggered and I couldn't get out of those emotions of being pissed. I could not stop being pissed. And then you start attracting more shit, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You create a magnetism. So practical um, advice. I meditated for years by like doing guided meditations or just trying to learn myself. And, um, you know, now we have more resources. You have an app called Headspace, which is great. You know, I think they're like 10 or 15 minutes. I've done it a few times. I actually sit around with the homies sometimes. We're like, yo, you guys want to meditate? And the guys that have been trained like I have, we do our practice and the other guys will do like a Headspace thing. Mm-hmm. Have you, you know- tried Brain FM yet? No, I haven't. Oh, you got to try them out. Cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Very similar type of app. I, I re- we really like the guys from over there. They got they have a meditation app on there also. Awesome, man. Oh, it puts you in the space like it's really weird. 
That's dope. Yeah, like five, 10 minutes into it and you're like in that space. Yeah. So, you know, we're lucky now. So I think someone who's more entry level is like, oh, meditating's boring or it irritates me or I can't make my mind quiet. <clears throat> that just means you need to. Yeah. Apps, totally. like, apps like that are useful. Um, but I think what's really been profound for me and why I said there's like, there's no no amount of money or anything you could give me. I mean, I, you could like, be like, make a deal with the devil and, you know, have anything I want. If I just give up meditation, I won't. Um, I practice something called Vedic meditation, which I learned from Jeff Kober about six years ago. And that is an actual practice. So there's a way that you do it. And there's a certain period of time. You do it 20 minutes. Yeah, I cheat a little and went 30, which you're not really supposed to. But, uh, you know, it's a tradition. Shit comes from the Himalayas 12,000 years ago or whatever, right? It's a lineage that's been passed down, but you do it twice a day for 20 minutes. And when I learned that, I was like, oh, this is what meditation is, you know, because you have a way that you start it and you have a way that you end it and there's something you do during it. And it's a mantra based meditation. It comes from the same lineage as TM transcendental meditation. The difference between Vedic and TM to my understanding is that TM is sort of like a company. It's an organization that trademarked, no pun intended, a formula of meditation teaching you pay for it. It's a whole thing and there's nothing wrong with that. It works for a lot of people. The Vedic thing is a tradition and you do pay for it. You pay your teacher Uh, It's a sliding scale kind of honor-based system of payment. Um, But you pay your teacher and uh, and then you go through like four days of training and then you have that practice and your mantra for the rest of your life. And the mantra meditation to me is really powerful because it settles the mind down because the mind always wants to do something and you can't stop the mind. I think that's what frustrates people with meditation is they think, oh, if you meditate, you're supposed to be quiet. No, meditation is when you let your mind do whatever the fuck your mind wants to do. It's like trying to stop your heart from beating. You can good luck with that. <laughs> you know, It's like trying to stop a pit bull from you know, swinging on a tire or whatever. It's like, dude, that's what the mind is there to compute and figure shit out. It's just that it overtakes us and takes control of us. And a lot of us have the experience that we are the mind. We get so hypnotized by our thoughts, oftentimes negative thoughts that you think that's all you are and you lose the perspective that, no, I'm a soul who's embodied in this physical meat suit that has a computer inside my head that wants to run my fucking life. And what the mantra does is it tells your mind, hey, look over here, right over here, watch this, watch this. And you repeat this mantra, say it, you know, you're not supposed to share your mantra, it's tradition, but let's just say it's Om. Oh, I thought thought that was a mantra. (laughs) (laughs) Yo, dummy, look over here. Uh, No, like your mantra would be just say like, Om, right? So the way it looks inside when subjectively when you're practicing Vedic or TM is like Om, Om, Om. Listeners probably can't even hear that, yeah. but the you're idea- whispering Om. Yeah, the idea is <clears throat> very, very subtle with the least amount of effort possible is you just gently, very subtly in the recesses of your mind, repeat that mantra. And then you'll start thinking about, oh shit, did I feed the cats? Oh shit, what about that parking ticket? And it's okay. It's okay, mind. You it's all right, mind. You don't fight the mind. You just come back to the mantra gently with the least amount of exertion possible. What happens is your mind kind of just kind of like trails off doing that thing and you the way this is just the way I look at it. It sort of distracts the mind and then you're able to dip into that transcendent space as you describe. You're able to get through through these apps and stuff where you're like, oh, whoa, it's quiet down here. It's almost like you're under deep underwater or in space and you're just like, Shh. and then it'll get quiet. And then the mind's like, oh, shit, I'm late for mind pump. What time is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so happened to me this morning. I, was, I looked at the clock a couple of times. And, well, am I going too far out there? I'm still in the world. You know, there's microphones, there's an event, there's shit I got to do. But uh, is the morning the best time to to meditate? Do you recommend that? Dude, I meditate um, first thing in the morning. I don't have caffeine. I love my bulletproof coffee and shit. Uh, I don't have caffeine before I meditate, no matter what. Uh, If I'm taking any sort of nootropics, which I do a lot, I don't do those before I meditate. The only thing I did today is I took my little micro dose of psilocybin before I meditated. (laughs) I don't know if that helped. Maybe that's why I went into that dope space. Who knows? (laughs) But um, yeah, I don't, and I don't check email or anything. I do check my texts right when I wake up just to see. I'm like, oh shit, am I in the wrong day or something? Because I'm kind of out there sometimes with scheduling. So I I check my texts. I'm might i'll admit i might like refresh instagram no not might actually i do that every day but i definitely don't open my emails or do anything that gets my mind very active Mm -hmm. because an email will be like okay you booked the gig you got the check it'll be something good and that gets me fired up it'll be like hey you were supposed to do this thing what the fuck Uh," and i'm like ah 
and I get in right, that. Right. So I don't engage with the world. I don't talk to people. Anyone that ever comes and crashes at my house, you know, in the spare room or, if, uh, you know, a girlfriend stays over, they know, don't talk to me before I meditate. I'm a total dick, <laughs> you know? So that's how I set the foundation. And then I, you know, I, I infuse in there some prayer and I'll probably read something inspirational, listen to some spiritual audiobook or, you know, something on personal development, a podcast or something inspiring. Uh, then I interface with the world. I think it's smart because it sets your intention or your energy for the whole day. That's probably, that's why I, if I do do it, I like to do it in the morning because it kind of sets the stage for everything else. Oh dude, you got to man. <clears throat> I honestly, I don't, th I don't see how anyone would survive. Maybe just cause I'm more nuts than some. If I don't meditate, I'm, I'm <laughs> bummed, dude. I'll know it all day. I'm like, oh yeah. I just think people don't know what they, they don't know. You know what I mean? So they just right. don't realize what they're missing. And when they start to do it, I had a client sell it to me once. And he told me, cause for me it was so hard Cause you know, it felt like a waste of time. Like, Oh, you know, 30 minutes, an hour. Like I got, I got so many things to do. And he says, no, no, you do this for 30 minutes. You'll get an hour back in productivity. Oh, that's so true. Which, which sold it to me. And then I went about it the wrong way. Cause I thought you had to meditate really hard. So I'm like, I'm going to meditate the fuck <laughs> yeah, out of this yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. which is the opposite of what I'm going to crush this meditation, yeah, which is yeah. the complete opposite. So. Well, I've, you know what I find, uh, the, the afternoon one for me, which is, you know, I won't say I do 100% of the time. I'm probably, probably about 80% of my days. I get that afternoon one between like five and seven, somewhere in there, another 20 minutes. And the afternoon one, see the morning one is sort of just processing everything that's been jarred loose in your subconscious when you're sleeping and you're, you're sort of off gassing, you know, whatever needs to be sort of dispelled, you allow the mind just to kind of like let the air out of the tire, so to speak. And the morning one is that sort of release and setting the foundation. But the second one is you've already done the morning one. The second one, you've only got any stresses that you've accumulated for that day that you're releasing. And those usually kind of dissipate in the first few minutes. And then you've got a good 15 minutes after that where you're really dipping down into that still spot. Cool. Yeah. The afternoon one for me is it's, it, it's, you know, and the discipline has come and gone and, mm -hmm. and go with that. It's like in the beginning, the first two years, I always did the afternoon one. Then I stopped for like a year. I was like, eh, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. I get in a flow state at five o'clock. I'm crushing a project. It's like, Oh God, I can't stop and meditate right now. This is lame. Now I happen to be back in a phase where I'm doing it. I'm like, Oh dude, the afternoon one is mm -hmm. really, really sweet. Very cool. What, uh, what's in store for, you in the future for your podcast in the future like what are your goals moving ahead for the lifestylist podcast which is called the lifestylist because it's about bringing together all these bits and pieces of a lifestyle you know mm -hmm. from the physical health stuff to the metaphysical and the spiritual stuff so you know what the goal has been and continues to be is to take sort of esoteric out there spiritual ideas and practices bring those guests on and present their teachings in a way that's relatable and applicable to just everyday people. And then taking ideas from health or biohacking and the same thing, you know, going to the super geeks in biohacking and like eh, translating their message and their practices into something that people can actually just start doing that day. So that's been the, the goal and continues to be. But since I live in LA and I come out of the entertainment industry, you know, I was a part of the story we didn't talk about was I was a fashion stylist for 17 years. And uh, which means I dressed celebrities and musicians and stuff like that for my job, weird job, but that's what I did. And it was fun and all that. But um, I see the, I'm not really into Like I don't watch award shows. I'm like, I don't do anything Hollywood. I'm out at the hot springs, like putting mud all over myself and shit. Like I don't live like the Hollywood, I'm not into the Hollywood scene. Nothing against that. It's just not my thing, but I was able to see the power of influence in that world. So mm -hmm. in terms of goals for my show is I'd really like to get, uh, more prominent people in the arts, musicians, actors, celebrities, things like that, but not because they're famous and I don't want to talk to them about their new album, their new movie. I don't give a shit about that. Everyone else can talk to them about that on Entertainment Tonight or whatever. I want to ask ones that meditate, that have a great fitness regimen, that are into yoga, that are into biohacking, that are into the lifestyle, because uh -uh. I know so many celebrities are into that stuff or just recovery. You know, guys like Slash, been sober 12 years. Like, how's that work, dude? Steven Tyler, another one of my guest goals, you know, that I worked with when I was first sober, when I was first um, an assistant stylist. I'd like to talk to those people that really have influence and reach. And, and I think that's because in my life, Steven Tyler, for example, when I was first sober, I got hired by uh, Aerosmith stylist. And I was like my first job when I was sober and they were all sober. And that was really inspiring to me because they weren't fucking dorks. 
you know, when I got sober, I was like, oh my God, I'm a loser now. Meanwhile, I'd been like a total loser as a young guy. You know, I'm down in the gutter, like looking at someone with a job, like, look at these losers, you know? And I'm like panhandling, shitting my pants on Hollywood Boulevard, literally. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's another story. It's, it's Again, another podcast. It's another, yeah, it's another podcast. But when I met him, I was like, oh my God, dude. Like, this guy's cool as shit. That's Steven Tyler. And he's like, yeah, bro, having no duels. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is cool. And that really influenced me. I was like, wow, they still make great music. They're still famous. They have all this money. They're having fun traveling around the world. And they just don't happen to be strung out on drugs. This is awesome. So uh, I think there's a lot of power in in that voice. There's so much influence that celebrity ha- has. How many, how many artists do you think need the drugs to, to make their sound? Well, here's the thing, man. Being somebody who's around it, appreciates music. Don't- I do. I think it's the opposite. See, when I was a kid and I looked at Jimi Hendrix or Keith Richards, Keith Richards is like my main idol still. He's my all-time favorite musician. But when I was a kid, I thought what made Keith Keith was the drugs. No, Keith was a badass musician when he was a fucking teenager before he ever tried drugs. <coughs> Hendrix was a badass musician before he ever took LSD. See what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't the LSD that made Hendrix Hendrix. It might have augmented his creativity, sure. But eventually what happens with any artist that crosses that line of addiction is it actually ends up killing the creative flow. It kills the creative energy because it cuts them off from their spirit. When you get addicted to drugs, you lose touch with spirit. And spirit is where all creative ideas come from, whether you're Nikola Tesla to Einstein to uh, Stephen Hawk, Hawk, What's his name? Hawking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. I think inspiration comes from, you know, the ethers from the universe, so to speak. And drugs give you an access point to a certain point, but then it turns on you, you know? So this is a very, I think a really common misconception with music that, oh man, Mm. you know, when I got sober, I was like, dude, how am I going to write songs? It's like, oh my God, I was so much more successful and creative when I was sober. And a lot of musicians say that Keith Richards, even, I mean, he still drinks his little red cup of vodka and Mountain Dew or whatever. But, you know, he claims he doesn't do coke anymore. He definitely quit heroin like in the late 70s, you know. So he's made plenty of good music, you know, not having the assistance of Mm -hmm. that. Not to say there's anything wrong with that either. It's cool, man. No, I just thought you'd be a great guy to ask that question because you've obviously been around a lot of these people firsthand. There is that uh, perspective that these guys and girls have these incredible albums when they're spun out on drugs. And so a lot of people connect that to, oh, maybe it's, you know, because of the drugs that they've... It's got. probably in spite of. Yeah. Right. I, th- I think it's, you know, that <laughs> they have talent and then maybe the drugs at different points give them access to it. But I always think, man, can you imagine what Kurt Cobain could be doing now? Could you imagine Jerry Garcia now? Yeah. I mean, you go on and on and on. All the really talented, beautifully gifted people that have died at the hands of addiction because they couldn't get help, wouldn't get help. That's imagine what they could have. Imagine if Hendrix was alive now. <laughs> exactly. Clapton, another great example. Clapton sober for 30 fucking years or something. Yep. That guy's had a pretty good career. Still no problem it. writing, you know, still slain. Right. You know, so it's like, oh man, you just, you just wonder. But, you know, there obviously has been, Here, here's the thing on the other side of that, like the pro drug thing is look at Beatles, uh, early 60s pre-LSD and then look at Sgt. <coughs> Pepper's. Whoa. Yeah. So would they have made Sgt. Pepper's if they never dosed? Probably not. So there's, you know, there is that side of it. But then again, you know, how sustainable is that? Yeah. Right. Tools are just that. They're tools and they can be used for many different things. And some of them are extremely destructive and some of them might be productive. Well knowing said. the difference between the two. I think well it's said. important. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it also did, like I said earlier, you... Some of us are just born with that addictive gene, that propensity toward being controlled by substances. And some of us can dabble. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sort of jealous of people that are like, you know, oh, once a year I go to Burning Man and just cut them. Not that I would want to go to Burning Man personally, but let's just say someone who's like a weekend warrior yeah. and they still can hold it down and be a good dad and like have their shit together, be a CEO. And then they go party and then come back to reality. I'm like, God, how do you do that? Because I'm just and it's in my DNA. No, what you said about um, addiction and then just, you know, regular use, I think was in, in very, very smart because millions of Americans, you know, every day drink alcohol, but we don't have millions and millions of alcoholics. Yeah. So there's definitely a big difference between the two. It's use and abuse. And it's so, weird, dude. I yeah. think there's two contributing <clears throat> factors. One is trauma in life. Big time. And the other though, cause I've met a lot of sober people that were horribly addicted that like had beaver cleaver, really healthy, yeah. great upbringing, plenty of love. And they're still just junkies like me. 
So trauma, but the other thing is, dude, there's just honestly something in our wiring, in our DNA. Like some people have the addictive gene and some don't. I have two brothers, Cody, who's a big fitness dude. I think I told you guys about him. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Story Fitness in LA. Uh, he's like me, can't touch anything or just he ends up in jail in 24 hours or, or less, you know. And then my other <laughs> brother, Andy, you, dude, you, I could be like, Andy, I'll give you a thousand bucks right now to take a bong hit. He's like, ew, like how, why? I don't like that feeling. Or he'll drink like half a beer and let it sit in there. I'm like, bro, you still have half a beer. I'm watching his beer more than him. And I, you know what I'm saying? I used to be his roommate and we'd, we'd have like a six pack of Corona in the fridge. And obviously I'm not drinking it, but we had it there for guests or whatever. And then uh, one day he cracked one open. He's like, oh God, this reeks. I'm like, what happened? He goes, oh, it went bad. I didn't even know beer could go bad. <laughs> mine only lasted for like a couple hours, you know? And and then I'd ask him like, you know, football game would be on or something. I'd be like, hey, you going to have a couple beers, Andy? He's like, nah. I go, oh, do you have to work tomorrow? He's like, no. I go, why don't you like get wasted? He's like, yeah. why? I don't, it doesn't do anything for me. It just mm. makes me foggy the next day. And I don't, in other words, it's not like the nectar of the gods to him. Whereas for me, when I was drinking, it's like the clouds part. I was like, oh my God, I'm in ecstasy. I'm in heaven. All my problems are gone. It just, it did something magical for me that it doesn't do for a regular person. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Man, you're a very fascinating guy. Very, Thank very you. fascinating. Yeah, Thank really you. enjoy talking to you. Yeah, yeah. It was a good time for sure, man. Definitely. Thanks. Yeah. I re- dude, I really appreciate you guys having me on. When I reached out, I was like, oh, I want to be in San Jose. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I love you know, sharing some of the stuff that I've discovered. Well, we enjoyed the, we enjoyed the time with you when we went down to LA. Um, you know, we meet people and if, if they, if they strike a chord with us or whatever, you were one of those people, like Adam said, you're very authentic and uh, we appreciate that. So mm. you're doing good things, man. Thanks dude. Appreciate yeah. you coming on. Right on you too, Thanks. guys. Right, yeah. Thank you for listening to mind pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.